The safety of the nation's milk supply was the topic recently at a hearing held by the House Subcommittee on Intergovernmental Relations. Subcommittee Chairman Ted Weiss called the hearing because he wanted to examine the Food and Drug Administration's milk monitoring procedures. Congressman Weiss has cited what he calls problems with the FDA's monitoring for residues of drugs routinely given to cows to increase their milk production. Witnesses at the hearing included officials of the Food and Drug Administration's Center for Veterinary Medicine, as well as a representative from the General Accounting Office. Milk industry representatives were also present. In a moment, Congressman Weiss gavels this hearing to order. My foot last week, and so I'm moving about a little bit more slowly than usual. Um, the Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations is now in session. Uh, and before I recognize our distinguished colleagues who will comprise our first panel, uh, I'm going to open with a brief statement. I recognize Mr. Thomas and any of the other members of the subcommittee who may have opening comments to make. <coughs> Two and a half years ago, we reviewed the Food and Drug Administration program, which is supposed to protect the public from the residues of animal drugs in our precious milk supply. We found serious problems, some of which FDA acknowledged and promised to address. Sadly, I must report today that little has changed since then. And FDA still cannot honestly assure the public that milk is safe. Today, in the words of Yogi Berra, it's deja vu all over again. Numerous shortcomings in FDA's program remain. The General Accounting Office, GAO, will report today that in 1992, government inspectors are only required to test for four of the 82 drugs that can be used in milk cows. These are the same four drugs they tested for 12 years ago. According to GAO, 35 of the most commonly used drugs have never been approved for use in dairy cows. FDA permits the use of these unapproved drugs under the agency's extra-label drug use policy. GAO will report today that these extra-label uses can cause potentially unsafe residues in milk. FDA claims to have made progress since our last hearing. But what we will hear today, I fear, is of a pattern of agency stumbling that causes many to question the capability of FDA to protect the public from harmful drug residues in milk. It has gotten so bad that even the milk industry will complain later today about FDA's misplaced priorities and lack of leadership. FDA bears responsibility for our losing faith in its credibility. On February 5, 1990, the day before the subcommittee's last hearing, 
FDA issued a press release designed to reassure the public that the milk supply was safe. FDA claimed that, quote, a nationwide survey of milk has found no residues of any antibiotics, including sulfur drugs. In fact, when FDA released the final results of its survey in April 1990, the agency admitted it had actually found low-level residues in more than 80% of the samples tested. A subsequent GAO report criticized FDA's survey and found it could not demonstrate milk was safe. GAO also found that FDA's monitoring effort is hampered by questionable industry practices. GAO reported that some veterinarians and dairy farmers purposely use drugs that they know evade detection by currently used test methods, or that they know are not normally tested for by milk inspectors. I remain concerned that our national milk monitoring program is broken and badly needs repair. I look forward to hearing from all of our witnesses. Our first panel, as I've indicated, will be four members of Congress who hail from dairy-producing states. I see only three. Oh, three members. On the second panel, we will hear from the experts at GAO. Our third panel will be the FDA officials who oversee the milk monitoring program. The fourth panel consists of individuals representing the milk industry and veterinarians. And now, let me recognize our distinguished ranking minority member, Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm happy that uh, this meeting, uh, this hearing has been called. I think these are important issues. I will file my statement for the record so that our our associates can can go forward. Without objection. No. Let me just say that uh, the key point I think of this hearing is the product, the milk product in our markets is safe. The screening methods do indicate drug, uh, drug residues, although they may not be able to identify the specific ones. That doesn't mean, of course, there aren't things that ought to be done, uh, both with the extra labeling and with the process for for uh, discovering any problems with milk. So I will file my statement. Let me say, Mr. Chairman, that it does seem to me that if our purpose, as I assume it is, is to examine this issue and find out what the problems are and what to do about them, it would be most helpful if this GAO report were made available, certainly to the witnesses and to anyone else who's interested prior, including myself, prior to the time of the hearing. It would seem to me that we could make arrangements to do that, and indeed should. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to comment on that, it is the practice of this subcommittee, and I think most of the subcommittees of government operations, that <coughs> GAO reports are released at the time of the hearing itself. Um, Mr. Payne? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me uh, also take this opportunity to recognize you for your leadership in calling this hearing and this very important topic. I'd also like to extend my regards to my colleagues before us, and I look forward to their testimony. I was uh, present at the hearing two and a half years ago, and I see that again we are faced with addressing the issues of control standards established to protect human health and whether adequate constraints exist to accomplish this. The possible risks associated with the long-term ingestion of dairy products tainted with animal drug residue are causing mounting public concern. I think we have to determine whether the concern is well founded. But in February 1990, <clears throat> the Food and Drug Administration released a statement that was supposed to alleviate public concerns about the safety of our milk supply. However, when the FDA published the results of a survey in April of the same year, the agency acknowledged the, low, the presence of low-level residue, residues in more than 80 percent of its samples. Traditionally, states have been responsible for maintaining a safe milk supply. In 1991, the FDA implemented the National Milk Monitoring Program, where the states and the FDA collaborated their oversight responsibilities. What is painfully obvious is that this FDA state venture is inadequate. 
out of the 82 drugs, as it was indicated before, that can be tested, the FDA only tests four of them. Additionally, 64 of the 82 drugs commonly used to treat animals are capable of leaving residues that can potentially affect human health, and 35 of these drugs are not approved for use in dairy cows. The FDA was established and mandated to protect the public by ensuring that products recommended for approval are safe for their approved use and that the residue effects do not negatively impact human health. If there are any health risks associated with this type of exposure, we as public officials have a responsibility to carefully examine the testimony before us and make a determination with the public safety in mind. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, thank you for calling this hearing. I look forward to hearing the witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. And now our distinguished member from Vermont, Mr. Sanders. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to express my support for your ongoing efforts to ensure that the FDA and other federal agencies carry out their responsibilities in protecting the health and safety of American consumers. <laughs> Uh, as a member from the state of Vermont, the state that is not only uh, a large dairy producer, but a state which has a reputation for producing quality and wholesome products, I'm extremely concerned about FDA's apparent lack of monitoring of the milk supply in this country. The dairy industry is heavily dependent upon its reputation for supplying nutritious and healthful products. It is absolutely in the best interest of both the dairy industry and consumers that widespread testing be implemented so that only residue-free milk is brought to market. Testing must include not only approved drugs, but those commonly used as a result of FDA's extra label use policy. Mr. Chairman, we have a responsibility to protect American consumers and the reputation of one of America's most trusted products. I look forward to the testimony today and hope that we can get to the root of this problem. Thank you. Thank you very much. From time to time, during the hearing, we'll be inserting into the record without objection uh, documents relevant to this matter. Before we begin, let me say to our colleagues on the first panel that the full text of your written statements will be inserted in the hearing record. We've asked you to summarize your testimony in five minutes so that there'll be time for questions after each panel presentation. Uh, Normally, we, we swear in all of our witnesses. We make an exception to colleagues. We assume at all times that you will tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Uh, and so uh, with that, let me ask uh, you, Mr. Stenholm, if uh, you'll lead off, and then you'll be followed by Representative Gunderson, and then by Mr. Walsh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to visit with you today about animal drug residues and food products, particularly milk. This is an extremely important issue, and I commend the subcommittee for your interest. Mr. Chairman, every time this issue is visited and the debate does not progress beyond allegations of wrongdoing, innocent people unfortunately get caught in the crossfire. The people who get up every morning and milk the cows, those who are honestly working to set up herd health programs, those who process the milk, those who sell the products in the grocery store, and those who eventually buy the products. I say it every time I get a chance because it is factual. We are blessed in this country with the safest, most abundant food supply at the lowest relative cost of any other country in the world. And one of the reasons we can say this is because of the drugs used in food producing animals. But it is a complicated issue and one that should be judged from many viewpoints before we can possibly reach an equitable solution. It is an issue that does need debate, directed at the goal of clarifying and improving an already successful program. That is why I have introduced the Animal Medicinal Drug Use Clarification Act to provide some direction to those involved in the debate. Veterinary medicine is like any other science. It is constantly evolving. It is constantly discovering new uses of drugs, new and better ways of diagnosing and treating disease. And we need to build flexibility into our regulatory system to allow this progress to develop. In the meantime, I believe that the responsibility for producing a safe product free of dangerous 
animal drug residue starts at the cow with the veterinarian and the producer. The veterinary profession and the dairy producers have realized this and have pr produced their quality assurance program. The solution for safe food does not lie with assigning food safety police to every farm in the country as some would recommend or to test every gallon of milk that comes to market. The taxpayer consumer deserves better management of their scarce dollars. The solution, I believe, lies somewhere closer to the steps the industry is taking to prevent animal medications from getting in the products they produce. This program was developed in response to public and industry concerns that animal medication residues were finding their way into the nation's milk supply. The program requires every tanker of milk to be tested for residues of the most commonly used animal medications before it is unloaded. Farmers whose milk is found to contain illegal drug residues face escalating fines and eventual loss of their license. Farmers who get caught shipping milk with drug residues must be certified by a veterinarian to be in compliance with the program before they can ship milk again. It is true that some drugs are currently only randomly tested for, but it is also true and should be pointed out that there are some drugs, for example, calcium EDTA, used to treat lead poisoning that may only be used once in a veterinarian's career. Lead poisoning in dairy cattle is extremely rare. A possible reason one wouldn't test for a drug like EDTA is because they know they'll never find anything and don't want to waste their valuable resources chasing a wild goose. It should also be pointed out that for some animal medications, there are simply no tests available at this time. The technology is in the developmental stage and does not yet exist. But, and it is my understanding that GAO agrees, industry quality assurance programs like those being conducted by cattle, pork, and milk producers should be encouraged because they are aimed at keeping residues out of milk and meat before they get to the market. I would like to think that the emphasis dairy producers have been placing on getting animal medications under control on the farm is a major reason why recent milk testing conducted by consumer reports found no evidence of drug residues in excess of government standards. These findings square with recent nationwide FDA tests, as well as industry tests, that also show no residues in excess of government standards. Let's set some goals. Give the animal agriculture industry some targets. Give the agency a workable, clear set of instructions. And finally, let's stop scaring the American public with talk of an unsafe food supply. For example, terms like residue don't automatically mean something evil in the food product. Residue means only that something remains in the food. Yes, let's talk about those residue levels that are indeed a problem and unsafe for humans to consume. But let's not confuse those with residue levels that do not cause problems and are indeed safe. Let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not hinder good medicine with our desire to create a pure food supply. My hope today, Mr. Chairman, is that we can start the discussion of building a better regulatory mechanism that looks at the big picture. From the birth of the heifer calf to the milk she eventually produces to the grocery store product that consumers know to be safe and wholesome. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my, my statement. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Senholm. Uh, Mr. Anderson? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here. I come to you as the congressman from the largest dairy producing district in America. I have more dairy cows in my district than I have constituents. And I often tell people that they complain a lot less. Uh, so uh, uh, that's why I'm pleased that we went to a one man, one vote system. <laughs> <laughs> when we go one cow, one vote, look out for Wisconsin. All right. Um, Mr. Chairman, my comments will focus on efforts to address drug residues in milk. The milk monitoring network has been greatly enhanced over the last two years, and I want this subcommittee to know that. As you know, last year the dairy industry voluntarily launched a major initiative to help dairy farmers and veterinarians improve the health of dairy cows, reduce the need for medications, and further ensure the safety and wholesomeness of milk and dairy foods. The Milk and Dairy Beef Quality Assurance Program includes a 10-point set of guidelines 
to implement a series of on-farm controls to assure the production of quality milk. This program has been endorsed by the FDA and the Department of Agriculture. Since January of this year, the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, adopted by the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shipments, requires each milk tanker to be tested upon arrival at a milk plant for beta-lactam antibiotic drug residues. This testing increased from samplings four times each six months to testing each and every load. I repeat, testing each and every load. Should a load test positive, the entire load, which can be upwards of 40,000 pounds of milk, must be properly disposed of because it cannot be used for human or animal consumption. Samples taken from each farm on the tanker's route for that load must be tested to identify the producer of the contaminated milk. Once the producer is identified, he or she is prohibited from further shipments of milk until subsequent tests from the farm are negative. Beginning last month, as before, the offending producer's right to market milk is suspended until his or her milk no longer tests positive. But an additional disincentive was added. The offending producer's ability to market grade A milk is automatically suspended for at least two days and the producer is required to complete the quality assurance program. Also, on July 1st, in conjunction with the new national requirements, my home state of Wisconsin, and I would encourage the subcommittee to look at this, implemented a more stringent law dealing with this matter. Called the Ag-60 regulations, dairy producers are to be docked the equivalent of two days' worth of milk production for the first violation, and four days worth of milk production for repeat violations occurring within 12 months of that first offense. Two days of milk production on the average Wisconsin 50 herd is worth $3,800. Producers of milk that has tested positive are required to complete the 10 point quality assurance program with their veterinarians within 21 days. If the program is not completed, the producer's grade A permit is downgraded to grade B, milk not eligible for fluid use, and therefore much less valuable. If after 45 days, the program has still not been contemplated, completed, the Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection will file a complaint to suspend the producer's license to market milk. Additionally, the receiving plant may recover the cost, get this, of the entire load from the offending producer. A 20,000-pound load of it, let's say the most recent Minnesota-Wisconsin price of $12.46, would be worth $249,200. That's quite a disincentive to a producer to market milk in violation of the standards. Between July 1st and July 22nd of this year, eight loads of milk totaling 230,000 pounds worth more than $2.8 million was dumped in the state of Wisconsin because the milk violated residue standards. Mr. Chairman, Wisconsin is aggressively vigilant in implementing this new program to assure the total safety of its milk to the consumer. In 1991, Wisconsin produced 24 billion pounds of milk. Wisconsin milk producers have and want to maintain a reputation for providing the nation with a reliable, high-quality food. They are very proud of what they do. Implementation of the Ag-60 regulations are a clear indication that Wisconsinites want to retain nationwide consumer confidence in their products. There will be other witnesses here today to present testimony regarding the efficiency of the FDA testing validity, extra-label drug use implications, and processor testing methodology. But I'm here today on behalf of Wisconsin's dairy farm families, and I'm here to plead with this committee to look beyond just FDA to the total testing chain. It would be extremely unfortunate if consumers are somehow led to believe that milk products are tainted. Give this new quality assurance program in its entirety a chance to work. We today have the safest milk supply anywhere at any time, and it's even getting better. Mr. Chairman, I thank you and Mr. Thomas for giving us the chance to make our testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Gunderson. Uh, Mr. Walsh? Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of this subcommittee. 
uh, for holding this hearing and for allowing me the opportunity to testify on this important topic. I represent uh, a district in upstate New York in the central part of the state uh, where we have many, many dairy farms, uh, on average about 60 animals per, uh, milking animals per herd. The necessity of ensuring that our milk is protected from animal residues is e essential. However, I am seriously troubled by rising consumer perceptions that question the quality of our nation's milk supply. Critics of current milk safety regulations often rely on emotional arguments that are misleading and needlessly confuse the public. While Congress and the FDA need to closely monitor animal drug residues in milk, it is imperative that we get out the message that our milk supply is the safest in the world and acknowledge the steps that the dairy industry has taken to address consumer concerns about milk safety. Over the last two years, the dairy industry has been deeply involved in improving milk standards through ongoing educational, regulatory, monitoring, and enforcement actions. The Food and Drug Administration began a residue monitoring and surveillance program in 1991 that samples milk from farm bulk tanks, tanker trucks, processor silos, and supermarket shelves. Exhaustive industry research has led to the development of better screening methods of animal drug residues. Furthermore, to prevent residues in milk, the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shipments has implemented revisions to the Pasteurized Milk Ordinance, the body that sets standards and prescribes practices for a variety of milk production activities. Also, beginning in January of this year, new federal regulations went into effect that require the testing of all milk arriving at grade A dairy processors provide stiff, uniform penalties for farmers determined to have violative residues, and, and provides for unannounced on-site inspections of farms and processing plants. Of even greater long-term benefit in improving milk safety is the creation of the Milk and Dairy uh, Beef Quality Assurance Program, a program designed to educate milk producers. It was developed by the National Milk Producers Federation and the American Veterinary Medical Association, along with input from government regulators and other dairy and animal husbandry experts. This 10-point program promotes herd health and reduces the need for medication by stressing disease prevention, proper drug use, and on-farm residue testing. Does the enactment of these new guidelines mean that everything is perfect within, with current FDA milk monitoring practices? Of course not. More education of milk producers on animal drug residues is needed, and more stringent enforcement by FDA will be required. However, FDA, the dairy industry, and the veterinary groups have been acting responsibly to address legitimate concerns, consumer concerns, about milk safety and have enacted meaningful reforms that will help ensure that milk and animal, animals destined for human food do not contain violative residues. I hope and trust that this subcommittee will recognize the good faith efforts by the FDA and the dairy industry to enhance our milk monitoring network and will not demagogue this issue by trying to create doubt about the safety of our milk supply. Lastly, I strongly reject the implication that dairy farmers and veterinarians are purposely evading screening methods of the FDA. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before you and I especially thank my colleague Craig Thomas for his assistance on this issue. I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Walsh. I want to thank each of you for taking time from what I know is a very hectic schedule, particularly at this time of the legislative year, to participate in these important hearings. And before we go to questions, I note that our distinguished colleague from New Hampshire just came in, Philip, and I'd like to recognize him for any opening comments he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would like to ask unanimous consent to have my uh, opening statement included in the record. And, uh, Without objection, that will be done. Sorry, I'm uh, late. With That's that. all right. I was, too. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Mr. Stenholm, according to a May 26, 1992 FDA memorandum, Dr. Gerald Guest, Director of FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine, was asked his views on the Senate version of your legislation. The memorandum states, and I quote, that he does not think that FDA should actively support this bill, that this particular bill falls short of achieving a solution to the problem, and that industry has said that it can't support the present bill." Close quote. 
The subcommittee has found no record of FDA communicating those views directly to you. Are you aware of FDA's assessment of the legislation? Not at this time, Mr. Chairman, no, sir. Okay. On May 8, 1992, the Animal Health Institute, uh, incidentally, we're going to be operating under the five-minute rule uh, for questions. On May 8, 1992, the Animal Health Institute, which represents the animal drug companies, wrote to the American Veterinary Medical Association to say that it would not support the extra-label drug use legislation that group had asked you to introduce. The Animal Health Institute described the legislation as, quote, narrow and, quote, counterproductive. What is the basis, if you know, for their opposition to your bill? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, would you know what the basis for the uh, opposition of the animal drug companies, the Animal Health Institute, uh, to your legislation? They've, said, they've written to the American Veterinary Medical Association, who asked you to introduce legislation to begin with, uh, indicating that they would not support your bill. Uh, they, they said that it was narrow and, and, and counterproductive. Beyond those adjectives, uh, do you have any idea as to what their basis for their opposition is? Not at this time. They have not conveyed those objections to me. I might add, Mr. Chairman, that in the legislation that, we, that you refer to, as in all legislation that I am a part of, uh, we put together what we believe to be a good package that addresses the legitimate concerns of, in this case, of, of the utilization of drugs in animals and some of the other problems associated with getting products onto the market, getting them approved in a timely factor in, in, in order to uh, be of use to the industry. In so doing, we never pretend that the original cut of the legislation has all of the perfect solutions. As, as you know, uh, as all of us know serving here, that the legislative process allows every party to take a good look at the individual legislation before final decisions are rendered. Therefore, it, uh, I have not had these uh, reservations conveyed to me. They are not surprising, however, that there would be reservations in these areas and uh, that in the due process of the legislative process that uh, it will certainly be addressed and those concerns as well as others. In your testimony, you cite the survey conducted by Consumer Reports as proof that residues are not a problem. Are you aware of the fact that the authors of the Consumer Reports article question the value of their own findings because, quote, there is now no adequate <clears throat> government program to ensure that antibiotic levels will not rise? Mr. Chairman, I am well aware of numerous different opinions about what constitutes a safe food supply, what the various technologies should be or could be, not only in the milk supply, but in the entire food supply. It is one of the problems that we tried to address today, or at least to point out to this committee that there are legitimate questions, legitimate questions about the safety of our food supply. The problem that I have with many of the proposed solutions is that there are people who believe that there are answers to those valid questions. For example, we know that technology today is able to measure parts in the trillion, the quadrillion, I'm not sure how big the number is. It's even bigger than the federal deficit, and that's a bunch. And when we start trying to have technology to measure that, I believe, based on my limited scientific knowledge, but also based on the opinion of those whose judgment I do respect, believe that if we are bound and determined to have a standard imposed by the federal government that ensures there is nothing in our food supply, we're going to starve. My basic simplistic question or, or analysis of this, based on my knowledge, God himself did not create a perfectly safe food supply. And if that is true, how in the world can we expect the government to come up with a standard that we will apply our food supply to that can improve on perfect? And it's a, it's a result of our technology. So yes, I'm aware that the consumer reports, anybody that comes out with a report, I'm well aware that FDA criticizes their own reports because no one can stand anywhere and say absolutely unequivocally, this is the way that it is. That's why I started my statement to you today 
by suggesting that every time a hearing is held in Washington that suggests that our food is unsafe, and we get that is the spin that occurs, there are innocent people that get hurt. Innocent people, as Mr. Gunderson pointed out in Wisconsin, Mr. Walsh in New York, Texas, California, you name it, all 50 of our states, in which allegations are made that cannot be substantiated. And what, what in my subcommittee, where we deal in another area on food safety and the inspection service, I have been very frustrated because of our desire to turn our food safety inspection system to a more scientific direction, we have been completely stonewalled. Completely stonewalled in, in our attempts to do so. So yes, the answer to your question on the consumer reports, yes, I'm well aware of that. It's not surprising. It shouldn't be surprising to anyone. Okay, now, without getting into a theological discussion with you, uh, and I don't think that neither you or I want to uh, hold God responsible for the chemicals that are inappropriately uh, fed to cows or injected into cows, milk producing cows. Uh, it seems to me that uh, it's one thing to have natural problems. It's another to have problems that are man-made and created. And that, that's really, and, and then improperly monitored so that we don't know what, what in fact is there. Um, no, and, I, that, and that's, I, I, I should add on that, uh, you know, most of the chemicals that we're man-made today have been helpful, some have not. And those that are not helpful to our food supply, the producers of America are the most interested in removing them from the food supply at the earliest possible date, and that's where best science and technology and techniques need to be applied, and that's what we're here testifying on behalf of. Well, my time has expired. Uh, for this round, and let me now yield to Mr. Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for your contribution. I know how interested you are, and as are your constituents, and all of us, of course. What, um, Mr. Gunderson, do you, are there a satisfactory number of tests? Uh, is the product exposed to a testing process that is uh, reasonable, do you think? And uh, if so, uh, are the tests dependable, in your view? Well, I would point out that one of the things we all need to be careful about when we are testing for drugs is that you can isolate any drug test to look for components of a particular drug. I mean, each one of us could go to a medical doctor today and we could come back and say, well, we'd been tested for drugs and we got a clean bill of health. Well, that depends on what the test particularly looked for. And so I think we have to be very careful. There is not in existence today a broad-based test that's going to determine uh, all potential drugs in any of us or in any food product uh, per se. I would like to suggest that as you look at this issue of um, how are we going to guarantee consumer safety of our food products, in this case milk, we ought to understand that it does not, should not, and cannot, in my opinion, be done solely by the federal government. This ought to be a public, private, federal, and state partnership. The industry ought to. The industry is involved. The federal government ought to at least set standards, but to suggest, that, as Mr. Stenholm indicated, that we have the resources, the manpower, and the ability to conduct all the tests in this country is unrealistic. It is going to have to be a federal and at least state and in some cases local partnership in terms of that as well as perhaps that state like Wisconsin has done setting standards that are pursued much by the industry itself. That's the only way we can develop the comprehensive infrastructure that is going to respond whether it be to milk or any other residue testing that's going to occur in the food supply. Thank you. And that's generally the case now, isn't it? There's yes, that's state correct. Testing. Um, Stenholm, do you, it indicates uh, here in one of the statements that um, GAO found that FDA's monitoring effort is hampered by questionable industry practices. GAO reported that some veterinarians and dairy farmers purposely <coughs> use drugs that they know evade detection by currently used methods or are not normally tested. Does that sound familiar to you? Is that something that that has come before you before? Do you, are you familiar with that allegation? Yeah, uh, we, we hear that and, and I guess 
the world's not perfect. And no matter how many laws uh, that we pass, I, I always like to use the example of uh, there's various stop signs in Washington, D.C. Some say no turn on red, but every once in a while you see somebody turn on red anywhere. Really? You run a stop sign, you get in trouble. <laughs> you know, it, it happens. We, we can pass all the laws, but you're still going to have some that are going to abuse them. The important thing here, and this goes back to Mr. Gunderson's testimony, is the industry recognizes the absolute imperativeness of self-policing today. In this modern world of communication that we live in, and concern rightfully placed in our food supply, that we on the producing side of the question understand it's awfully important to us that we not have the sensational stories that occur when an individual on purpose does something. So the industry itself is in the, in the self-policing, and we need the hammer. And the hammer, I would suggest, is there today uh, to, to, to take care of those. But the idea that, that we can design a foolproof system in which somebody is not going to abuse it, either on purpose or by accident. And I would say, and in, in the final answer to you is, very rare does an individual abuse it today. Accidentally, yes. Because even where we have withdrawal, et cetera, uh, programs uh, for uh, various drugs, they're not foolproof either. Individual animals are different. Their very body systems are different, just like all of us are different. And, uh, you know, just, just take a look at the Olympics and see what happens to athletes from time to time, the unfortunate things that occur because of a misinterpretation, certainly not an abuse on purpose, but a misinterpretation. And the same happens in animal agriculture. Thank you, sir. Mr. Walsh, do you, uh, are you familiar with GAO's current study and findings? Uh, <clears throat> only uh, what I've heard today, Mr. Chairman, and, uh, or, and I would address this also to Mr. Chairman. Uh, we have not seen it. Uh, would like very much to have seen it before we came today. And, uh, um, it would have made our testimony a little bit easier if we had seen it. Yes, sir. Mr. Thomas, I, I didn't answer your question. And, uh, and no, I have not. And what's in the GAO study, I have not seen it as yet. And I might add, in, in our committee where we deal with many of these same issues, we make it a practice of making certain that all of the witnesses have access to the information in which the hearing is going to be conducted upon so that everybody has the opportunity to answer questions of this nature. I respect differences in committees and the difference in the way uh, people operate, but uh, uh, we're not accustomed to this. Thank you all for coming. I have no further questions. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Mr. Payne. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I really don't have any questions. I, of course, do have a concern about the, uh, we don't have any any dairy farmers in my district, so I don't have the same concerns. But we do have people that drink milk. And, uh, you know, as you do, I um, certainly can appreciate the concern about an industry that's so vital to a district. I uh, hear the arguments for the B-2 bomber a lot, too, because it's important to districts or the Seawolf submarine. Uh, I think, though, that there, uh, in our approach, uh, there's got to be balance. We have some problems in the East Coast with the quality of the ocean water and the fish that's caught. And we're seeing a tremendous concern about particular shellfish and, and uh, many of the New York um, uh, fish markets and concerns are under siege right now because of uh, poor quality of, of shellfish and so those members in that area are very concerned too because it's a very vital industry to some districts. I do think though that we do have an industry as I indicated two and a half years ago an industry that is probably among the best in the world. We have a great product, we produce a tremendous amount of it and it would appear to me that it would be incumbent upon the industry to do self-policing to be sure that the quality of their product is uh, the best that can be. Unfortunately, though, what we've seen, especially during the 80s, we've seen a new breed of business people in all kinds of industries where 
seemed like it was the decade of the greed, you know, and a lot of things were short-circuited and circumvented for profit. Uh, that's why we've got the SNL situation at BCCI. We've got more problems because the profit motive seemed to have driven uh, the concerns of all kinds of industries and businesses and products and developers uh, on a wrong track. And unfortunately, uh, government, I guess, sometimes simply has to, to be around to kind of monitor. I would be very pleased if I thought that the industry uh, could simply police itself, that if they found there were several hundred thousand dollars worth of questionable milk, that it was simply poured down the drain. That would be an ideal situation in society. From what I've seen during the past decade, as I've indicated, that just has not been happening. Almost just the reverse. If it's a close call, opt to err. And so I uh, don't want people to be alarmed either, but I think that there has to be some kind of uh, closure to this question of whether this, this residue and the number of drugs tested and uh, these reports are true or not for the, for the benefit of, of, of the business in your areas. And so I, uh, I too, look forward to uh, the testimony from the other witnesses, the FDA folks, and people from the industry to try to get an idea of where we're going because it is very, very critical to, to this country and to, our, uh, uh, and to the reputation of this fine industry. So I, I had no questions, just wanted to make that, that statement. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Payne. Sen. Chairman, um, <clears throat> let me briefly comment to my friend, Mr. Payne, that some of us think we can defend milk a lot more easily than we can B2 bombers. <laughs> product is much better for children also, I should say. I, I um, let me mention to, to ask Mr. Gunderson or anyone else who might like to comment on it. Uh, I, I agree with you, Mr. Gunderson, that ultimately there must be a federal, state, local, and private partnership. I, I don't think anyone thinks the federal government can do it all. And also coming from a dairy state, we're very proud of the farmers in our state who are up against the wall fighting hard to produce a really important product, and the overwhelming majority of farmers are honest hard-working people who are producing a product that this country and the world needs. But let me ask you, in terms of the partnership that you envisage, what is the proper role of the FDA within that context? And in your judgment, is the FDA doing enough right now? What should they be doing that they're not doing? I think the FDA role ought to be twofold, Mr. Sanders. First of all, the FDA ought to be setting the basic guidelines for states in the industry to use, and the FDA ought to be uh, developing the research protocols that uh, would be av made available to the states and or industry to use to detect certain residues uh, per se. So I, I think I think that's twofold there. Uh, the federal role is a unique role, and it's also very different, but uh, evidenced by the discussion that has just occurred. My guess is that milk from Vermont or New York goes into New Jersey. So to suggest that this is automatically going to be a New Jersey problem doesn't make any sense at all. To suggest that the federal government has the resources to inspect every load of milk shipped in this country is to say you don't understand the magnitude of this industry. So that's not going to happen either. We don't have the resources. The federal role, therefore, then is going to have to be we will develop those basic guidelines that, like we in Wisconsin who use with our Ag 60, or that the New York uh, or Vermont uh, Departments of Agriculture use in their testing, that the industry can use as, as a part of their industry police, and then also that as we get into these additional chemicals that we are now looking about, that we question whether they are or not safe, FDA more than anybody has to be the research arm that determines the protocols that can detect that and det determines the risk factor to human consumption. That has to be a federal obligation. I can kind of sure. Just to add on to that last point that uh, Mr. Gunderson made, I think that's something that we've grappled with on the Agriculture Committee, the De Department Operations Subcommittee. What is a what is an allowable residue? What is an allowable tolerance? The Delaney laws says zero residue, zero tolerance. Uh, I don't know if that's realistic anymore. 
uh, somewhere between uh, zero and uh, and uh, whatever the other point is um, is where we should be. And I think the FDA has to work with the the legislating committees to determine what is uh, a, 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 an allowable level and uh, what is the uh, uh, risk-benefit analysis of, uh, of, of whatever that level is. I, I don't believe that we can find any uh, uh, commodity today that doesn't have some residue of some chemical in it. And, uh, we should always be striving to reduce that residue level in whatever the commodity is, but we're not going to get a zero tolerance level today. Let me ask you, Mr. Walsh and Mr. Stahm, are you comfortable and satisfied with the role that the FDA is now playing within this uh, area? Uh, relatively uh, comfortable. I think that uh, if there are uh, chemicals that aren't being tested for that are determined to be uh, um, dangerous or uh, d disease causing to humans uh, that aren't being tested for, I don't know that to be a fact. But if, if, if that were to be the case, then obviously additional tests would be ha have to be performed. But they're taking the resources that Congress gives them and applying it to a problem that, or a problem as they perceive it and, and applying those uh, resources as best they can. If, if we feel more testing needs to be done, perhaps we ought to provide them with more resources. Mr. Stone. Uh, Mr. Sanders, uh, you know, uh, qualify to say every, uh, anything can be improved on. But I, I'm, I'm uh, uh, comfortable with the job that FDA is doing today, and, and I think it's incumbent on us, the lawmakers, to, uh, to spend a little bit of time recognizing some of the requests that we ask of our various agencies without providing the resources to do the job. Uh, and, and that gets back to what Mr. Walsh and Mr. Gunderson were saying and what, what we've all said in our testimony today, that we, the lawmakers, on behalf of our constituents, need to come to some basic conclusions as to what is safe. And tolerance levels, trying to convince the average consumer that a little bit of carcinogen in your food is okay is rather difficult. But the point I made is it's there. And with the technology that we have, we're going to measure it. And it's not going to be man-made. It's going to be made before it gets to the cow. And therefore, those are the kind of decisions. Before, we, before I feel compelled to be as critical of our, the bureaucracy in this, I want to be a little more self-critical in some of the areas in our committee and working with you on this committee, I believe that we can come up with a guideline that will be more acceptable, or possible, I should not acceptable, but more possible to administer in a fair and efficient manner that will serve the consumer, the producer, and everyone in between. So I'm reluctant to be critical because I realize some of the things that we in this body, in our best wisdom and judgment, have not been as productive in allowing them to do their job as we could have been. Thank you very much. Mr. Um, I would say that, that uh, milk producers certainly have a major benefit uh, to ensure that their product is, is uh, safe and of the highest quality. And uh, my son is a vet and uh, is involved. Uh, and uh, I might just have each of you uh, just tell us from the, per the prospect of each of your involvement with your states um, relative to self-policing programs that have been recently introduced. Uh, is there a marked degree of, of improvement? Um, and, and can you describe that? In other words, in terms of testing results, in terms of uh, are we on the right track by going through the self-policing? And can you describe the, the difference uh, in, in terms of results at this point in, in each of your states? Mr. Uh, Zeloff, you came in late, and let me just try to uh, briefly uh, indicate what I had said in my testimony in Wisconsin. In addition, in addition to the federal uh, efforts, in addition to the industry uh, self-policing, we in Wisconsin, the state of Wisconsin, have adopted new regulations known as Ag 60, which require literally that every load of milk is going to be tested, that farmers uh, are uh, automatically penalized if 
if that load is contaminated, they can go to the fact of requiring that farmer to pay the entire cost of a load of milk, 20,000 pound load of milk. You can go to that one farmer because the whole load will be dumped. You can assess him a cost of 249,000 at the present MW price. Beyond that, as I indicated, in the month of July in the state of Wisconsin under these regulations, eight loads of milk totaling 230,000 pounds with a value of $2.8 million was dumped because they found one residue in the, each of those loads. I don't know what more any industry in the world can do to guarantee and show to the consumers of this country its commitment to a pure, safe product than is being done under that level of testing and standards. So the program is working as far as you're concerned? It, it is working and it's the concern I think we have that the news that comes out of this is going to be that somehow milk is unsafe when the reality is that when you look at the protocols at the federal, state, public and private partnership, you can't have a safer product with today's technology than we are today delivering in the state of Wisconsin. Myself, I would say ditto to what Mr. Gunderson has said and, and in response to the comment that uh, Mr. Payne that you, uh, you observed, uh, I did not suggest that we do not need a policeman. Uh, Self-policing uh, by itself is inadequate. And the industry agrees to that. What the point we're making is the industry is making a good faith attempt that is successful. It's successful in Texas, in Wisconsin, in New York, because every producer understands what the penalties are. They're very severe for rightful reasons. It's in, it's in the producer's best interest that we clean up the problems we have in our industry if we have them. We're not finding many. But we're finding some. When you're talking of less than one half of one percent, that's not much. And the idea that you can achieve perfection, I don't believe is possible. But as close to it as we can with the proper federal, state, local, and producer efforts, in our judgment, will give us the best result that will allow your consumers in New Jersey to feel as uh, safe as they should today that the milk they're drinking is safe. Mr. Zellif, if I could just comment, uh, using a, a Dairy Industry Food Safety Steering Committee report, uh, during 1991, 2.2 million tests uh, were done uh, on milk being delivered to processing plants by, by the producer. Uh, less than one half of one percent of that milk was uh, uh, tested positive. In 1991, same, uh, excuse me, that was 1991. In 1990, the year before, similar test, uh, there was about 33 percent more. So there was a 33 percent reduction uh, in um, positive tests over the, over the one-year period. So I would say that's substantial progress. If, if there is a, a bad producer in your individual states and, and under, what, under the, the uh, uh, idea of self-policing and within your individual states, how do you go about getting that particular producer on track? If there's if there's a bad actor, it's bringing the industry down and, and providing and, and causing problems for the industry. Um, well, in, in in Wisconsin, I mean, first of all, not only is the total load, but each shipment from each farmer is tested, right? So, so you can identify the producer per se. What we do is, is we will, do, until that farmer has met the new uh, compliance standards, we will prevent him from shipping any further milk. Okay. We will go beyond that to say that uh, we will penalize his income for up to four days. We will go beyond that to demote him from grade A to grade B. And we'll go beyond that to hold him liable for the entire load he's contaminated. I mean, if, if I'll be so wrong again, with you. If those four things haven't put that farmer out of business. The system should be working on. <laughs> nothing's going to. Thank you. That's true nationwide. Thank you, Mr. Self. Uh, I think the bells have sounded for a vote on the rule. Um, so I'm just going to sort of sum up with you. First, Mr. Gunderson, I want you to know that your statement as to what you think the uh, federal government's role ought to be vis-a-vis -vis the states and localities, I couldn't uh, agree with more. I think that, that that's absolutely right, and that, that's really been the burden of our uh, argument. The problem is that... Uh, the FDA has not been moving expeditiously on providing standards for the, for the states and for the localities. And so 
you know, the, the states are, are left and the industry is left more or less to, uh, to fend for itself. And uh, Charlie, the, the perfection that, that you don't claim but you're proud of, uh, the, the closest to which they come, that swell for the four products, the four, four residues that are tested for, the beta-lactans, but there are 78 others out there that are not being tested for. And that's the same situation that's prevailed for the last 12 years, and you ought to be more concerned about that than me. I, I don't have any, any farmers in my district uh, either, unless there are some in Brooklyn that I haven't uh, noticed <laughs> under the new redistricting. Uh, so, you know, it just seems to me that, that there really has to be a question of reordering the priorities of the, of the FDA to make sure that they do the job that the American public expects them to do. And all of our cheerleading for how safe our milk products are is not going to help us very much if all of a sudden one of those unknown 78 residues create a terrible problem. And then for the first time we'll start yelling and screaming and saying, why wasn't the FDA on top of the job? Now's the time to scream about it to make sure that the terrible part does not happen. I also know that you're aware of the fact that we have FDA documentation, we'll get to it later on, where you should be aware of the fact that there's a lot of cheating that goes on, where the, the farmers are, uh, the, the plants are tipped off as, as to when the inspectors are going to come. And they line up the tanker cars uh, so that the farms which are reputed to be clean farms are the ones that are going to be tested rather than the ones that have problems. Now again, that kind of misbehavior and misconduct, I'm sure is not something that, that you approve of. And it hasn't, it, you know, one, one report or four, four reports a year or every six months is not going to solve that problem, especially if there are no field workers out there to make sure that cheating doesn't go on. In any event, I think that we're at this point ready to break. Uh, if there are no further questions, uh, we're going to uh, recess and come back for the second panel, again, with, with our appreciation to our colleagues for taking the time to participate in these important hearings. Thank you. Subcommittee stands recessed for the next 15 minutes. The Subcommittee on Human Resources and Intergovernmental Relations is now back in session. And before you gentlemen from GAO sit down, <clears throat> if you stand behind your nameplates, raise your right hands. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Our second panel consists of officials from the General Accounting Office. GAO's testimony will be delivered by John W. Harmon, <clears throat> Director of Food and Agriculture Issues for GAO's Resources, Community, and Economic Development Division. Mr. Harmon is accompanied by Edward M. Zadura and William M. Layden. I want to thank all of you for your very important contribution to the public's understanding of the milk monitoring issue. Mr. Harmon, let me remind you <clears throat> that you have 10 minutes to deliver your remarks. Of course, the full text of your written statement will be entered into the hearing record. You may begin. At Thank this you, point. Mr. Chairman. We are indeed pleased to be here to discuss our work on FDA's efforts uh, to address animal drug residues in milk. Our testimony discusses FDA's actions to improve the long-standing gap that exists between dairy industry animal drug usage and testing capabilities, and then secondly, our evaluation of, USD, of FDA's uh, extra label. I, think I may have said USDA. I'm so used to USDA, I may uh, inadvertently put that in there, but it's FDA's extra uh, label use policy, which allows veterinarians under emergency circumstances to treat dairy cows and other food-producing animals with drugs or dosage levels that are not approved uh, for that animal. To their credit, FDA and the National Conference on Interstate Milk uh, Shipments amended the Grade A Pasteurized uh, Milk Ordinance in April of 1991 in response to your concerns in a report that we issued in November of the previous year. The revisions were intended to increase the number of milk samples analyzed, drug residues tested for, and test methods the states and industry could use. 
And I might mention at this point also that uh, that industry has taken a number of actions uh, since that agreement was made, as, as uh, has already been testified to, and uh, has achieved a great deal of uh, additional success in uh, in that effort. And particularly, we would we would continue to encourage this efforts of building uh, building quality in into the process uh, by industry. And that is the good news. The bad news is that implementing the revised milk ordinance suffers from ineffective federal leadership and the lack of a comprehensive strategy for monitoring animal drug residues in milk. FDA has not on overcome internal and external communication problems and has not been able to reconcile FDA state and industry differences needed to approve new tests and develop a national database to implement the needed revisions. As a result, states are still testing under the milk ordinance, and as you mentioned in your opening statement, for the same four drugs as in 1980. While up to 82 drugs that may leave residues are known to be or suspected of being used in dairy cows, FDA data indicate that 64 of these 82 drugs are commonly used or may leave residues that raise health concerns. 35 of the 64 drugs have not been approved for use in dairy cows and 12 are not approved for use in any animal producing, any uh, food producing animal. FDA has not approved any new screening tests for additional drugs, although states and industry have repeatedly called for such tests. Additional rapid screening test methods were to be developed by July of this year. New methods will not be available until 1993 at the earliest, and after that, training state and industry officials will need to be done. Development of a national database to collect state and industry testing data is also behind schedule. Program revisions require that uh, industry begin retaining and reporting residue data to the states in January of 1992. And the states require, were required to begin auditing these data in July of 1992. The startup of the national uh, residue database has been delayed in part because of resource constraints. In the meantime, FDA has launched another survey to test for 12 animal drug residues in milk. However, because of statistical and testing limitations, FDA surveys, a survey like its previous surveys, cannot be used to draw conclusions about the presence of, re the presence of residues, residues in milk. Further, FDA has uh, expanded this program to test the same four drugs that t uh, states are already testing for, and the annual cost of this uh, program is now at about uh, half a million dollars. Regarding FDA's extra label use policy, we found that although FDA intended the policy uh, would be used only in emergency circumstances, such use is in fact routine. FDA cannot enforce its extra label use policy effectively because it does not routinely monitor veterinarians' use of the policy and cannot detect residues of most drugs used in an extra label manner on dairy cows. Also, FDA has not developed empirical data on the use of or the need for the policy. Consequently, FDA cannot control the use of animal drugs or ensure that illegal or and possibly unsafe drug residues are not getting into milk or the food supply in general. Further, FDA's limited enforcement of extra label uses undermines the federal drug approval process by discouraging animal drug companies from seeking FDA approval of those drugs or those uses of their drugs that are now extra label. And finally, when a drug is used in an extra label uh, manner, important safeguards against marketing unsafe animal drugs are bypassed. In particular, health and safety data are usually not available. Consequently, veterinarians may lack sufficient information on the dosage levels and milk discard times needed to ensure that illegal and or unsafe residues do not occur. We believe that FDA needs a comprehensive strategy to address animal drug residues in milk. This strategy should, at a minimum, include uh, efforts that would, uh, that would integrate the various responsibilities for ensuring milk safety that are spread across several FDA offices, that would implement the 1991 revisions of the milk ordinance, such as implementing the National Residue Database to collect needed data within more realistic time frames, that would resolve uh, which type of test method is necessary for the states and industry to monitor milk under the milk ordinance, and to determine how FDA's monitoring program fits into the overall federal state monitoring effort. That completes my summary, Mr. Chairman. We'd be pleased to answer any questions that you or the members may have.
thank you very much, Mr. Horvath. Mr. Harmon, what health risks should consumers be concerned about from animal drug residues in the milk supply? Well, there are basically three risks that uh, are involved uh, with drug residues, three basic risks. One is, uh, has to do with allergic reactions by those people who are maybe sensitive uh, to drugs that are contained in milk. Uh, the second one has to do with uh, bacteria becoming resistant to the drugs because of continuous exposure to, to the drugs and uh, as a result uh, exposing people to infections. And then finally a slight increase in the risk of uh, long-term health effects such as, uh, such as cancer. Those are three basic uh, 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 health uh, risks that uh, consumers uh, may be faced with. You indicated that the states are only required to test for four of the 82 drugs that can leave residues in milk. The test they use is known as the BS disc assay. What are the limitations of this test? Well, the basic limitation of the disc assay test is that it only is only really effective on uh, four four drugs, uh, and uh, there are five other drugs that uh, can be used on, and, and it's possible, but it's not uh, it's not as effective. And also, uh, there are many other drugs uh, that of the 82 that we identified that it can uh, perhaps identify the possibility of drugs in milk with those, but it can't uh, identify to what extent. And, and if, if I can add an example, the example would be sulfamethazine, a suspected carcinogen. The disc assay can detect sulfamethazine at about 15 parts per million, which is about 1,500 times higher than the safe level that FDA set at, at 10 parts per billion. You reported that uh, 64 of the 82 drugs on your list are commonly used on dairy cows and or may leave residues in milk that pose health problems. How many of those 64 drugs can be detected using the BS disc assay? Four. If most of these 64 drugs are not being tested for by the government, how could FDA have even a clue of the actual extent to which our milk su supply is contaminated with animal drug residues? Well, essentially they can't, uh, and for three uh, basic reasons. First of all, they're not testing for the drugs. So without testing for them, you can't, you can't know whether in fact they are or are not in the milk. Uh, the second problem there is you have a lack of uh, testing methods to be able to test for, those, for many of those drugs. So that, that creates uh, another problem for FDA that needs to be resolved. And then finally, as, as, we, as we have in our testimony, as I mentioned in the summary, they need data. Uh, on what the states are doing. They need to develop this data residue program so they can get some assurance of, uh, of what's going on out there. So without that, uh, they can't have assurance that, uh, and they can't uh, assure with any degree of uh, reliability that, uh, that, the drug, that the milk is, is safe. Earlier this year, FDA surveyed the states to determine if they are voluntarily using three of the most popular screening tests. The result, not one state is using the CHARM-1 test, only six states use the CHARM-2 test, and only three states use the DELVO test, DELVO test, P. Why are so few states using these tests? Well, based on our discussions, and uh, Bill or Ed may want to add a little bit here, but uh, based on our discussions, the test, the uh, states are, are waiting for FDA leadership in this area, and that's and that's what was agreed to in the milk ordinance, and it's not happening. Uh, the states, in committing to do screening tests on their own, would be taking a certain uh, risk, and they would be investing a certain amount of resources to do that without knowing whether that test is, in fact, going to be approved by FDA. Our discussions with the state officials clearly indicate that the states are waiting for FDA to specifically designate which methods to use for regulatory purposes under the milk ordinance. And until FDA makes that uh, determination, the state officials are reluctant to spend the money to develop and or to begin using other test methods. In 1990, GAO recommended that FDA develop much better information 
on the incidence of residues in milk. Specifically, you advised FDA to create a system whereby state and industry officials could report their screening test results as well as information on the types and sensitivities of the tests used. Did FDA agree with your recommendation? Yes, they did. And uh, they did begin efforts to develop uh, the National Drug Residue uh, Database. Uh, also, the uh, efforts uh, in making revisions to the milk uh, ordinance uh, came out of, uh, of uh, their agreement with those, uh, those recommendations. Essentially, they have not set up the databases yet. Uh, they had plans to, uh, to do it. It wasn't funded. It wasn't one of their highest priorities. They now have just recently, within the last five days, sent out an RFP for a third party to, uh, uh, to set up the database. They're hoping to do it in 1993, and of course that's if funding is available. We are told that the milk industry has been doing a lot of testing. Is it your testimony that FDA's failure to collect and validate the industry data makes it impossible to know whether the industry data is reliable? That's correct. That's uh, correct. Essentially, uh, the industry is doing on its own, to their credit, a lot of additional testing, but it is again for basically the same four drugs. FDA was supposed to, as part of the milk ordinance revisions, designate additional drugs and additional tests that were considered valid for that purpose. They have not done so to date. I can add. I think Representative Gunderson said it well this morning in terms of it has to be a partnership between federal, state, and industry testing efforts. What's missing right now is the federal component that provides the additional verification of what industry is doing so that the consumer is certain that, in fact, the milk they're drinking is safe. Good. Let me yield to Mr. Zelliff at this point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, relative to the previous panel, uh, and their testimony on voluntary testing programs by the industry. Um, how would you characterize the, the, the quality of those programs? Do um, you feel that uh, they are on the mark? Do you think we have sell safe product? Uh, we think that those efforts by industry are definitely very positive steps. Uh, and they're steps in the direction that we would very strongly support in terms of, as I said, building quality into the front end, making it the industry's responsibility, which is, it is industry's responsibility to assure the quality of the, of the product. And I think they're very, very interested, in, uh, and as well they should be, in doing that. The problem they're having right now, and I think it's very well stated in their testimony that you'll hear, hear a little bit later, uh, it's very difficult for them to, to take a big step without FDA leadership in establishing the standards and in approving these these uh, screening tests or additional tests that need to be done on these other 78 drugs or any number of those 78 drugs that are not now being tested for. So the industry is, is hamstrung by the fact that they can only test for the four drugs, as, as uh, Mr. Tajori just uh, mentioned. But it's to their benefit to make sure that they have a safe product on the market, and you indicate that they are moving in that, in that direction. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, any reactions, you meant uh, you, you talked about uh, possible cancer, you talked about um, uh, allergic reactions, you talked about bacteria. Any, uh, can you describe the, the level of complaints that we're getting and any, is there any way that we can tie that into uh, any there's, specific uh, There's just no data, there's just no data as far as I'm aware of that, uh, of, of that. I mean, these are, these are possible health effects from residues in milk. Potential that, that could happen, that's right. but we that don't could, know that of could any happen. cases where it did happen. We don't even know to what extent these drugs are existing in milk. To at least some extent, at a, uh, uh, a meeting a few months back, a, a speaker, uh, an FDA speaker, did cite uh, evidence of research showing, for example, the growth uh, uh, in the number of uh, uh, microbials that are resistant to antibiotic treatment. Essentially, it, it means that they have been subject to low levels, or may mean they've been subject to low levels of antibiotics in either feed or by injection. As a result, the uh, microbes are getting more and more resistant. Uh, I believe one of the speakers at the uh, conference estimated that the cost to uh, human health care because of having to uh, use more drug therapy and, and hospitalize people longer because of these uh, resistant germs is in the billions of dollars. 
when you get into that, I mean, I, I don't think I could probably uh, summarize what you just said very easily. Um, what kind of people, what, what kind of staffers, what kind of, uh, uh, what's the background of people that are, that are, that are on the GAO that are, that are doing this, the, the testing that, w that you're referring to? No, we did not do that. FDA researchers did that. I'm okay. just telling you that at a conference, the FDA researchers presented a paper saying that the, the, the uh, increase in the number of germs that are now resistant to antibiotics may be costing us, in, in terms of human health care, billions of dollars a year. That in the report, um, some background information about the research literature, medical literature, which indicate a distinct relationship between antibiotic use on dairy farms and in human infections as a result of consumption of, of products emanating from the dairy farms. And you can attribute it, that directly to milk? Um, in this case, it's the dairy farms. It may not necessarily be to milk, but it may be to uh, meat tissue consumed mm -hmm. from the uh, slaughtered cow. On the GAO study itself, um, what, what was the background of the, of the staffers that, that did the report? Well, the background of our staff that, uh, that responsible for this report are basically GAO evaluators that are trained in carrying out uh, uh, investigations, particularly in management areas and in looking at whether or not federal programs are, are effectively working. We don't, we didn't have a sign, if you're looking to ask that we'd have a, a well, sign. I guess, curious, it, were they veterinarians or were they oh, no. chemists? Were they people with, no. with background? That no, we, we, uh, we rely and talk to a number of people in the industry that are veterinarians and we also uh, did extensive discussions with FDA and uh, we maintain what we have as internal controls to make sure we're not off base. On, uh, on what we're coming up with, but it wasn't. I would not call this a, a necessarily a scientific study. Uh, it, it doesn't take, I don't think, very much uh, of a genius to go and say how many drugs are used in dairy cows and how many are testing for. I mean, you, you really don't have to be a scientist to do that. And that's the type of work that we did. We also looked at what are the management systems that exist in this program to, to make sure that things are working right in terms of uh, coordination with any agency, in terms of how it's working with industry, those, those sorts of uh, issues. Have you compared, uh, did you work with industry people who are self-policing at this point and responsible for the self-policing programs? We uh, had discussion with a number of industry people as well as uh, veterinarians and uh, Bill or Ed, you may want to elaborate that on that. Uh, yeah, we met we extensively. To all the major associations, um, both representing dairy farmers, various segments of the milk industry as well as the veterinarian community, and even those that specialize in bovine veterinarian medicine. It was not only from that information but also from the state contact people as well as experts within the Food and Drug Administration and U.S. Department of Agriculture. Could you uh, provide the committee with a list of the people that you did talk to? Um, We'd be pleased to do that. Okay. And um, do, uh, let's see, uh, I guess that's, uh, that's all I have right now. Thank you. Back. Thank you, Mr. Sella. <clears throat> Mr. Payne. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Harmon, um, you commented on uh, three reactions, I understand, allergic, oncogenic, and uh, bacteria, these kind of resistant strains. I wonder uh, if you could elaborate more on the uh, oncogenic uh, uh, reactions or what you might have noticed uh, in your uh, report. You want to hand that? If I may respond to that. Mm. For a good number of the drugs that may be used on dairy cows, FDA has not reviewed or approved them, so there is not adequate data to assess whether or not they have a potential to create long-term effects. Second, even if they do create long-term effects, it's difficult to measure those in society. The Centers for Disease Control within the HHS usually monitors epidemiological research, but it's difficult to track long-term effects. You may be exposed early in your life and the occurrence may not develop until 20 or 30 years. We know of at least two drugs that are on the list that we provide you, sulfamethazine and nitrofurazone, which FDA has itself determined are suspected carcinogens and which we know are commonly used on dairy cows. There are no individuals that we came across that actually developed um, tumors as a result of consuming milk, but the evidence indicates that that risk exists. And uh, do, do you know whether the FDA is zeroing in on this to, to do 
further studies. Both of those drugs from the list of, uh, if you will, approved drugs for extra label use. Uh, however, there is no way to monitor for those drugs. So you can ban the drugs, there's no way to enforce the ban. Mm. I have no uh, further questions. Thank you, Mr. Payne. <clears throat> In your 1990 report, you also recommended, as J.O. did, that FDA evaluate screening tests for sulfur, tetracycline, and other drugs so that more tests could be added to the milk ordinance. How did FDA respond to your recommendation? Well, they agreed also with, uh, with that recommendation, and in December of 1990 began to take action that, uh, to review two of those screening tests, I believe. Uh, and so uh, they have, uh, and also through the milk ordinance, uh, there was procedure established uh, that would that would charge FDA with establish, reviewing and evaluating screening tests, approving those screening tests so that industry could use those tests in their efforts. How many screening tests has FDA evaluated as a result of that December 1990 announcement? Bill, you want to take that? Yeah, FDA has technically evaluated two screening methods for one drug as a direct response to their 1990, December 1990 announcement. Why hasn't FDA evaluated more screening tests? The agency has, for the most part, postponed its evaluation of screening methods while it works with the AOAC Research Institute under the provisions of the revised milk ordinance to set up a new program to evaluate screening methods to recommend them as part of the regulatory scheme within the milk ordinance. The agency also has evaluated one other screening method called CHARM-2. I believe it's still in a preliminary phase and the reports are still being written. So since our last hearing, how many additional screening tests has FDA recommended that the states use to test drugs other than the four beta lactams? None. Can you briefly explain what an extra label use is? The briefly part may be <laughs> difficult. Uh, uh, under extra label use and under the uh, uh, food, Federal Food, Drug, Drug and Cosmetic Act, only those drugs which have been approved by FDA and uh, for labeling and for use on uh, animals can be used and it has to be used according to that uh, instructions on the label. Uh, what's happened is they've also uh, pa have a policy which allows veterinarians to, uh, to use drugs if that animal is in some sort of trouble, uh, extra label, that is in situations where the drug has not been approved or tested for that use in that specific animal. Now, what are the potential risks to consumers from the practice of extra label use? Well, if a drug is used in an unapproved manner, the Food and Drug Administration, which is responsible for approving new animal drugs, has not had the opportunity to review data submitted by the drug manufacturer to determine whether or not the drug is safe for both the animal as well as to people who will consume the food products derived from the animal and whether or not the, the product itself will work as it's intended to work. So consumers could be exposed to a drug for which the safety hasn't been determined and perhaps equally important to what we've been discussing so far this morning, this afternoon, is there is no method to detect because usually when someone comes in and wants a new animal drug approval, they must not only submit the data to demonstrate the product is safe but also a method by which the Food and Drug Administration or the states could test for residues. And in this case, if a drug is used in an extra label manner, the safety data isn't there and may not have a test method, and so the residues may escape detection. FDA intended that extra label use only occur rarely. Has that, in fact, been the case? No, no we found it to be uh, fairly routine, as a matter of fact. Now, what is FDA doing to minimize this practice? Well, at this point, very little. Uh, first of all, as we've mentioned many times, the uh, testing uh, methodology just doesn't exist. They're not monitoring uh, veterinarians' compliance with the, uh, with the policy. So uh, they're not in a position to really know to what extent, or, and they haven't developed data on the extent of the use or whether it's indeed, uh, indeed required use. So uh, FDA's efforts here have been uh, minimal. In your investigation, you conducted extensive interviews with state milk inspectors and all segments of the milk industry. You reported 
that the states and almost all industry groups are frustrated by FDA's lack of leadership and failure to confront milk monitoring problems head on. What is the state's greatest frustration? Well, the states are interested in carrying out their responsibilities to, uh, to assure uh, a safe milk supply. And without these screening tests, and, uh, which are reasonable and uh, cost effective for them, they can't carry out their job. I think that's their greatest frustration. And they're, they're very interested in doing that. You heard from uh, Congressman Gunderson. I think uh, the work that uh, the efforts that have been done in Wisconsin are very commendable. And it indicates the extent to which states, particularly those dairy producing states, are interested in making sure the supply of milk is, uh, is safe. And uh, they're, uh, they're just not able to do that until some of these uh, screening tests and some of these efforts can be done to identify residues of drugs that, uh, that are not now able to, they're not now able to identify. The states, I gather, need quick, cheap, reliable screening tests, and FDA has failed to provide them. Instead, FDA continues to develop laboratory methods that are complicated, expensive, and not practical for more, most states to use. Is that correct? That's correct. You reported that certain segments of the milk industry are particularly concerned about the extra-label drug use policy. Could you elaborate on that? Well, the extra-label drug use policy uh, to the extent that it allows drugs to enter into their product that uh, cannot be tested or cannot be controlled is a, is a threat to them. And as long as that situation exists, it, uh, it allows, uh, it opens up the possibility of consumer concern. And as long as you've got that possibility, there's always the, uh, the situation you referred to right before uh, uh, you adjourned uh, for, uh, for the vote. And that is, it only takes one time, uh, like the Alar, incident and uh, they're, in, they're in deep trouble uh, economically and how, we don't know how long it will take to recover from that. GAO reported to this subcommittee in November 1990 that FDA's efforts could not demonstrate that milk was safe. Given all the problems that you have described in FDA's milk monitoring program since then, can we place any faith in any assurances we receive from FDA that the milk supply is safe? We cannot play, place any more assurance, and we don't believe FDA can uh, provide any more assurance now than it could back in November 1990 when we said that they couldn't provide assurance. So uh, our position in that regard certainly hasn't changed. Mr. Zellup. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to, uh, since records have been kept and tests have, been, uh, have improved, uh, has the amount of tainted milk found at processing plants increased or decreased? It's, are you referring to the new revisions to the milk ordinance? That's correct. It's our understanding that since January 1992, when the industry was required to screen each tanker for beta-lactams, the amount of milk that was dumped increased, especially in the first few months. The FDA, though, has not collected any of that data, which is the need for the databases we mentioned earlier. But that's synonymous with, uh, with, with, with industry self-policing taking the extra step making sure for their own best interest that uh, any milk that's tainted gets dumped. How about before, the, before January? But again, the, that tests were mostly limited to beta-lactams, and we were mostly talking about just the four drugs. Okay. So there's still a whole spectrum of drugs that were untested. What you, what in, me in reality, Mr. Zellif, if we were able to test for many of these other drugs, the likelihood is that the amount of rejections would go up. There's all kinds of incidents from warning labels, uh, from warning letters from FDA to uh, uh, other testing that's been done to some of the sophisticated laboratory methods that only can be done sort of one at a time on one sample that indicates there are other uses out there. There is uh, likely sulfa is being used, sulfa drugs. There is likely tetracycline is being used. Uh, nitrofurosin uh, uh, dairies and veterinarians have been cited in warning letters for using those on dairy cows. If we had rapid screening tests, the likelihood is we would find more drugs. Now, I will say that the, the efforts of Wisconsin uh, that, uh, that uh, Congressman Gunderson cited, which uh, presents some very uh, strong economic incentives for people to not use these drugs, probably once that got going and you had tests for these drugs, you'd see better, you'd see, if you did see an increase, you start to see probably a decline because of that, uh, that uh, penalties that are required. But that's Wisconsin. That's not uh, FDA. Okay. Uh, do, all, do all drugs leave a residue after use? No. No. 
Okay. And but, but let me clarify that. Because drugs can be used in many different ways. So it, not, it, doesn't, doesn't, it just doesn't depend on the drug per se, but how it's used. So for a drug that FDA has approved, if it's approved and used according to labeled in instructions, it may not leave a residue. But if it's not used according to label instructions, it may leave a residue. And there are several drugs on our list that have that potential. Do all drugs with residues, uh, are, are, they, are all drugs uh, that leave residue uh, unsafe? Uh, probably a question of degree. Uh, antibiotics are in effect designed. It, it's, it's probably a question of degree. In, in reality, antibiotics, just like pesticides, are designed to kill some offensive thing, in this case a germ. Uh, uh, they could, at high enough levels, cause problems, whether it's toxicity problems, long-term cancer risk, allergic reactions. Uh, they essentially could. As Bill said, properly used uh, with proper withdrawal times and dosages, uh, those approved drugs should be leaving low levels of residues that FDA has determined would not be a health concern. Um, I get the feeling, though, that, that uh, you feel that we're on the right track with what industry is doing, and particularly with the testimony that we heard before. Uh, Absolutely. In, in self-policing and compliance. Industry's biggest need, I think as John said, is for FDA uh, and uh, working with AOAR, uh, AOAC uh, Research Institute here to approve some additional rapid, reliable, inexpensive screening tests so they can screen out products that we don't want in our milk. Given that, they will, all indications are, react by implementing those screening tests. They have on their own, in some cases, used screening tests. The problem is uh, those tests themselves have not been determined to be valid and to really detect the proper drugs at the proper levels. And, and I just want to make sure that I understood right your comments before. There are no known, even though the potential exists, there are no known cases that, that you can uh, certify at this point in terms of cancer, in terms of uh, uh, allergic reactions, in terms of bacteria uh, becoming re resistant to drugs. I mean, the three cases that you outline, you have no known cases that affected the consumer. So I have to assume that from the best best information available that, that the milk that's on the, pro on the market right now uh, in the shelves uh, in, in the product that we buy is relatively safe. Is that true? I think the, uh, the issue here is uh, really, as the chairman pointed out, the extent to which the consumer believes it's safe. And these kind of issues that are raised uh, erode that, that uh, confidence. And to the extent to which they do erode that confidence, I think it represents a threat, certainly to the industry, and that's why industry is so concerned. Uh, I don't think we can say that the milk is unsafe, but the same token, we can't say that it's safe because we don't we don't have the data, we don't have the information, and uh, neither does FDA. But there's a there's a lot of effort out there by the industry, probably more so in milk than any other food product, to test and to try to try to make sure that it is safe. Well, and, they, have, uh, they certainly have a lot to gain by that. And they have a history of doing that uh, through uh, pasteurization, of, of course, and that process that evolved uh, back when uh, that threat existed. So there's no doubt in our mind that, that this industry has the uh, wherewithal and has the incentive to take action if they get the proper federal leadership. Last question, Mr. Chairman, uh, if I can. As you did your course of study, um, did you detail how the drugs were being used, whether the vets or the producers were following certain withdrawal uh, periods, uh, the appropriate withdrawal periods, um, or did you just simply take an inventory of what you found? Uh, how thorough did you go about that study? Let me let uh, Mr. Zajor address that. Uh, we did extensive research, number one, through a lot of groups to come up with a list of drugs that we thought were being used, and, and we essentially cleared that with FDA and state people and dairy people. Um, in effect, there is evidence to indicate that uh, two things are happening. Number one, there is illegal use, clearly illegal use, not by veterinarians, by producers. Uh, FDA has sent out warning letters uh, when they have found residues. FSIS, that's within USDA, finds uh, lots of illegal residues in uh, meat tissue. Um, they, for example, have referred 12,000 cases to FDA in the past two years of drug residues that exceed the safer tolerance level, uh, level for follow-up. 
In some cases, uh, I, I can cite you some. Uh, here's a series of warning letters, 10 times to one uh, dairy, eight times to a cattle producer, eight times to another cattle producer, warning them about illegal drug residues, including penicillin, genomycin, for which there's no tolerance in edible animal tissues, neomycin, sulfamethazine, which is sulfamethazine, which is the suspected carcinogen. In other cases, they have warned veterinarians. And when FDA has investigated these cases, in anywhere about 25 to 30 percent of the times, they have found that veterinarians are involved in the treatment. The problem is a veterinarian cannot assure, even under the extra label use policy, that once they leave the premises that the farmer, the producer, will follow it. Uh, there is another case I can cite you here. Twenty times the approved dose of penicillin G was used. The withdrawal period was cut in half. That's absolutely the opposite direction you want to go. Okay, FDA sends these warning letters out all the time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Zell. Mr. Payne? Yes, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, do you have any uh, recommendations that would result in a more effective policy regarding extra use labeling? Or are the implications such that it should be done away with? Yeah, the extra label use. Uh, now, we do have some recommendations uh, aimed at that. This is not a very easy issue to deal with because uh, this policy came about largely because these drugs would be used, were being used anyhow quite extensively. So uh, what uh, FDA did was try to uh, provide some guidelines under which they should be used and should be controlled so it would provide a, a better level of safety. And uh, the Within the context of uh, developing a strategy for dealing with these, we think this needs to be addressed. There's two other issues we think that, uh, that, uh, that could be dealt with here, and that is there's no knowledge of the extent to which it is being used. There's a certain, there's a consensus that they are rather routine, but uh, under what conditions are they being used? Are they needed? Uh, data needs to be developed on, uh, on what's happening out there. And we, we, uh, the National Academy of Sciences is already uh, convening a panel to take a look at uh, extra label drug use and our recommendation really is to have them consider this issue as part of that uh, that effort. The other thing is we would offer up for consideration is that the extra there are 12 drugs that uh, that are used now on uh, that are on our list that are not approved for food producing animals we would uh, argue that a certain level of safety may be increased if you just uh, provided that only drugs that have been approved for food producing animals could be used in an extra label manner. That would, uh, uh, that would provide a assurance in terms of the fact that at least the drug approval process has been followed through FDA for one food producing animal. Now you don't know how that drug will react in, from, a, from uh, a pig to a cow. But still, it, uh, you would have some health and safety data there. You'd have some data that perhaps the veterinarian could rely on to make some more better judgments about withdrawal times and that sort of thing. In, in your, uh, thank you. In your uh, uh, research uh, with the FDA, do, do you feel that they're uh, adequately staffed? Um, that's that's an issue that comes up in every, and we've been doing food safety work, I guess, for some three years now, and, it, and it's an issue. It's a very valid issue. Uh, resources. Uh, that's been uh, studied and it's been confirmed that they have a resource problem. Our problem is when we go in there, it's, it's almost every issue is a resource problem, which seems to indicate to us that there's some strategic planning problems there in terms of what is priority, what's not a priority. And even in this situation, we have questions about priorities uh, when we look at the, the data issue versus the uh, question of whether you need to go out and take uh, 250 to 500 samples of milk, some of which industry is already doing, and, and uh, whether that money could be better. I mean, that's those kind of questions of, uh, of how you're using your resources, I think, need to be addressed as well as there is, there is a resource problem. There's no doubt about it. There's a resource problem in terms of, in terms of all the things that Food and Drug Administration is being asked to do. So, but I wouldn't just throw that out as more 
resources means better performance. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Mr. Hobson. Yes, sir. Briefly, Mr. Chairman, I, I haven't heard all this dialogue, but I'd, I'd like to ask a question or two. I guess uh, if the HPCL tests were approved, you have, that's a good one, but it's pretty expensive. If you had CHARM 1 and CHARM 2, it's less expensive and would do some of the job, if not all the job, uh, to alleviate whatever fears you may have. Can you tell me, one, what is, why in your perspective is there a holdup in approving those? Industry, obviously, I think is using the, the charm, probably not the HPCL. What is the holdup? Is it money? Is it perspective? Um, and what would you recommend to get on with it? Our view is, I mean, based on what we, uh, we've seen, it's not money. Okay. Uh, it could become a problem, but it's not money. Uh, there's a basic disagreement here. Okay. Philosophy. And uh, Ed, you may want to... Okay. Um, could you elaborate? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, I'd like you to elaborate sure, on the philosophy. We, uh, uh, we mentioned before, I think in our testimony and in our report, that... Uh, Can you get up the microphone a little more? Sure. We mentioned before in our report and our testimony that uh, industry and the states are somewhat frustrated with uh, the inability to get FDA to move forward on screening tests. In all honesty, I have to say the GAO staff is too. Uh, two years ago, we recommended uh, very strongly that they take actions to approve uh, additional screening tests. Uh, they concurred. They started out, essentially, they did uh, 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 the research on, on two tests, but only for one drug, and did some other work on CHARM2, for example. Uh, as part of the PMO, again, they came out with a program that said we will work with the AOAC Research Institute to approve screening methods. A year has gone by now. They've uh, written a memorandum of understanding but still haven't signed it. It'll be several more months after that before AOAC, A AOAC can begin the, uh, uh, their study. And then even when a test is approved, the FDA will have to go out and train and certify the, uh, uh, the state people on how to use it, who in turn will have to do the industry people. That means it's going to be four or five years since we told them and others have told them this many times too, before we get any additional screening tests uh, available to the states. And that's, and that's if they're used. There's still a philosophical disagreement here between on regulatory what, tests. On what the regulatory agency, FDA, believes is necessary to pursue an enforcement action or a potential enforcement action, to have a regulatory method to identify and quantify a particular drug, as opposed to what the states and industry may be willing to accept um, under the milk ordinance to reject a load of milk because it tests positive with a screening test for which you may be unable to identify using the screening method the specific identity or the specific amount of drug that's present. Essentially, I, I FDA, I, FDA is insisting on developing single residue regulatory methods primarily which have to be done in the lab with expensive equipment. They take a long time. You can't use them next to the tanker in front of the processing plant. Uh, their argument is that because is they they're afraid they'll, they'll come before this committee and we'll tell them their test is not perfect? Or, or no, no, seriously, because they have a, they're worried about being criticized. Is that the, the philosophical difference? Or is they don't like regulations? Or, I mean, nobody's answered to me what the, the oh, philosophical no, that's, problem that's, well, is. Well, the philosophical problem, they think you need a regulatory method that you can take to court, and the industry and the that, states are saying, we need a screening method, and since we're the ones that take the regulatory action, we don't understand well, your position, FDA, and I, I think the industry well, will tell you, you, that. You, can, you can understand somewhat sometimes their, I don't necessarily agree with their reaction on this, but you can understand they're damned if they do, damned if they don't. If they go out and do these partial tests and they're not perfect, the next thing you're going to hear is they didn't do their job. If they go out and do it to the nth degree, then they're going, then they can't be criticized. And, and, you know, then your, your next report will be, with all due respect, <laughs> you didn't do your job because you didn't do it perfect. And someplace along the line, we have to get some understanding between people who do your job, rightfully so, and the people on the other side and understand the parameters they're operating within. Because I think they're so hyper about being perfect that we lose sight of the real world. And I think you're right, the tanker test is one that 
that probably should should be there. But these people, again, have to take, we live in this world, we want everybody to be perfect. And those tests won't be perfect. Well, it's interesting, though, Mr. Hobson, that the, uh, the disc assay test is effectively a screening test. It's been approved for 12 years. They fully support that. And they, in fact, after five years of effort, have never been able to de de develop a regulatory method. On the one hand, they're willing to take the disc assay without a regulatory method. On the other hand, they won't approve any additional screening tests. But your basic point, I think, is well taken. Uh, and that's why, I mean, GAO comes up here, and I've had criticism from the Agriculture Committee for making this kind of recommendation in other areas, and that is a strategic planning area. But there's, there's some basic things that need to be done so people right. understand what you're doing and how you're going to get there. And that's not happening. And if that happened, we could understand, this committee could understand, the people involved could understand. And if something goes wrong, if you have a screening test and somebody challenges that test in court, then you've got you've to back up. But, but right now, the customer here, which is the states and industry, are saying, we need get this. On with it. And, and they're I, not getting it. And I agree with that. And I think we do need to get on with it. And I think uh, most people in the industry will agree that we, if it's a simple, cost-effective test that they can easily administer, they're for it. Uh, I think, we, but I think also there is this um, mindset, contrary to the other thing, and that may have been done 12 years ago or something, that that they're going to be, they've got to be perfect. And and I, this is an area where we we need to get these tests out there, and we need to get a, a, an agreement between them and you and the committee and others to to work to get these tests out there. Uh, the states, and you know, usually it's the states saying don't. Don't do this to me. Here they're saying, you know, do it to me. You know, get get us the stuff available. And I, I think we need to uh, to work on that dialogue. Being an auditor is sometimes a very great profession. I I've dealt with auditors in the private sector more. I've than been I on here. both sides too. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. The the problem really is that FDA. I mean, you're, you're providing a marvelous argument for them, but nobody, no, else, has, nobody not, else has raised it. I'm and not arguing for FDA. Well, well they're, they're the hang-up in this situation. And in the course of the last couple of months, we've had a number of hearings in which FDA's attitude is that we'll take care of that manana. That, oh, I would ask the question of upgrading uh, genetic testing laboratories. And what, what, what time frame are you suggesting? Months? Years? Oh, it's years. Well, lots of luck. I mean, there, there's just no attitude of urgency. There is no sense that people's lives, the American public's lives, never mind the industry's lives, is dependent on what they do or don't do on a timely basis. For them, it's like they've got forever to come up with a solution. And if they don't do it on their uh, watch, somebody else will do it on another watch. Well, that's not good enough. That's not why Congress passed the legislation, why Congress put them in business. And we have been at it um, for the last few years in, in trying to goad them. Nothing seems to help. And I don't know what the answer is. We get a new commissioner coming in who's well motivated, who really wants to put drive and, and zip into the agency, but the, the same people who were there before will give you the same lazy excuses as before. And I know that technology can't be necessarily mandated to move forward, but we could be doing better than not having had any advances in 12 years. Well, I, I would, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I, I think this uh director does have some vigor uh, that I haven't seen uh, for some time in a government agency and a lot of agencies and I, I am hoping that he's listening uh, because I'm not defending FDA in this. I'm just, I'm trying to get a situation where we can get these out uh, and where uh, we can uh, proceed with a positive fashion. I think the milk supply, uh, mo most people have great confidence in the milk supply. Uh, there, but as you say, there may be these problems. And if there's, this is a way to alleviate it, I think they should get on with it. 
hopefully they will uh, change their vigor that, that that has been expressed by the chairman and, and get into this situation in a responsible fashion to solve this problem, uh, or at least the, the appearance of the problem. And I think appearance uh, can be detrimental in a situation like this. So I think it's very important that there be a positive reaction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hobson. If there are no further questions, uh, Mr. Harmon, thank you very much. You and your colleagues have done, I think, an outstanding piece of work, and we really appreciate your spending time to explain it to us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Our Our next panel is from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. FDA's testimony will be delivered by Dr. Gerald B. Guest, Director of FDA Center for Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Guest is accompanied by a number of other FDA officials. As I explained earlier, it is the custom of our committee to swear in all witnesses. So, would you all please raise your right hands Do you uh, swear or affirm that the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. And Dr. Guest, I want to thank you for being with us today. Please take your seats. What? And uh, Dr. Guest, uh, I want to thank you for being with us today. In fact, all of you, I know that you have very busy schedules. Uh, would you please introduce your colleagues to the subcommittee? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. My name is Gerald Guest, and I'm the director of the Center for Vet Medicine. With me from the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition, and sitting to my right is uh, Dr. Douglas Archer, who is the, director, the deputy director of that center and Mr. Johnny Nichols, who's the chief of the milk safety branch for that center. On my left is Dr. Bert Mitchell, who is also with the Center for Veterinary Medicine and representing our Office of General Counsel. To my far left is Mr. Michael Landa. Okay. Good. Thank you. Uh, let me remind you that you have 10 minutes to deliver your remarks. We have many questions that we want to discuss with you. So I'm going to ask you to please summarize your statement in the lot of time. Of course, the full text of your written statement will be entered into the hearing record. I do want to discuss one matter with you before you begin remar your remarks. Among the documents uh, which you were good enough to provide to us, to the subcommittee, uh, there is one dated April 28th of 1992, and it's from Karen A. Kandra, uh, and she, pardon? Give me a okay. I'm going to read you just a couple of lines of it. It's a very brief memo to start with. Uh, uh, she sends this to. Uh, I don't have a very clear copy. She sends this to Judith Ann Gushy, Edward I. Ballatin, uh, Bonnie Dean, George Albert Mitchell, Richard Geyer, Philip J. Frapo Frapioli, Frapio, uh, Dr. Norris E. Alderson, Mike Talley, and John J. O. Rangers, Dr. John J. O. Rangers. Uh, and she comments in the, in the first couple of sentences about all, how pleased she is to have gotten all the materials from uh, the various uh, uh, offices within her, the agency. And then she says, I'm still getting documents from ORA and 
the field. And Donnie called yesterday to say he had another stack from CVM. Hopefully, we'll snow Weiss with paper, and he'll be so overwhelmed, he won't make this request again. Thank you all for your cooperation in this matter. Now, would you explain that memo to me? What's that all about? <laughs> well, I don't know. Uh, I suspect it's the, the lady who was collecting all this material was probably working late in the evening and was probably frustrated by the extent. And I, no I noticed she writes this at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, she may have felt that way at that time, uh, Mr. Weiss, but we certainly don't. Uh, we're always happy to cooperate. If uh, When you ask for documents, we take that very seriously, and I think Ka Karen Kandra does too. So uh, we, we hope you've gotten all the documents. We hope you've had time to look at all the documents, and we'd be happy to be responsive to any questions that you might have. Well, it seems to me like it's a game plan so that we don't necessarily get to the truth but, because that, that, but that we become so overwhelmed with the documentation that you supply to us that we'll never be able to find the truth. Fortunately, we have a very diligent staff which goes through painstakingly and finds even brief memos like that. Uh, and so I would appreciate uh, the, the agency having a clear understanding of what our relationship is and the attitudes and the constitutional responsibilities between executive branch and legislative branch as far as oversight is concerned. Now, if you proceed. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are here to talk about uh, milk, and certainly we're here to discuss extra label use to the extent that you would care to do that. Would you pull uh, the microphone a little bit closer to you? It's hard to hear. Yes, sir. Uh, we have not, as others have mentioned, had a chance to see the final re GAO report, but I think when we do have a chance to uh, review that, we'll be, we'll be glad to uh, respond in whatever way is appropriate to the uh, recommendations. We did see a copy of a draft of the GAO report uh, in June. There was a continuing uh, discussion with that audit staff through the month of July, so I've assumed that some modifications have been made. At the time we saw the draft, however, we did not see any of the conclusions, nor did we see any of the recommendations. So uh, some of the things that are being said here we will review for the first time uh, once we have a copy of, of that particular document. <coughs> I also would like to uh, mention that a number of times today it's been pointed out that uh, milk is only being tested for four drugs. Uh, and I think in your opening statement, Mr. Weiss, in, in, uh, in, in the proximity of your Yogi Berra quote, uh, you mentioned that government inspectors are only required to test for four of the 80 true drugs that can be used in milk cows. Uh, I just need the record to reflect that uh, there is a national drug residue monitoring program that tests about 500 milk samples of tanker trucks per year and that 16 drugs are routinely tested for there. So we just need to be sure that we don't get uh, too focused on this four drugs issue mm -hmm. and I would like to come back to that a little bit uh, later on in, uh, in, in my uh, opening statement. We have done a lot since the last uh, hearing. Uh, there are a number of, of safeguards to ass uh, assure that milk is safe. We've increased monitoring. We've developed and reviewed additional methods for both screening and confirmation of drug residues. We've modified our extra label drug use policy by the addition of specific drugs that are prohibited for use in dairy cattle. We've withdrawn the approval of a number of sulfonamides and the nitrofuran containing products and we've worked hard to educate the dairy industry. There's also some concern about uh, our working relationship between centers. I can assure you that that, uh, that is not a problem and we've established a milk working group to enhance that kind of communication and hopefully to do the kind of strategic planning that has been suggested by the, the GAO in their testimony here. Uh, 
I don't need to repeat the fact that the milk industry since January 1 is, is testing every tanker truck for the beta-lactam drugs. Those are the uh, drugs that are penicillin and penicillin-like. The, those are the drugs that are most likely to cause an allergic response in people, and that incidentally is probably, uh, from a likelihood standpoint, the most serious problem that uh, uh, a contaminated milk with uh, a beta-lactam might uh, might impose at the levels that we've seen uh, up to now. The states do monitor that program. Uh, they started on July 1 with random sampling and routinely reviewing the lab records at those dairy plants. So there's a good program in place, uh, and that was at the uh, initiative of the agency plus the National Conference on Milk Shipments. I also mentioned earlier the National Drug Residue Milk Monitoring Program, which started in February of 1991. We realized that the state programs and the industry programs needed to be supplemented because we needed to look for more than just the beta-lactam drugs. And because of that, we put this program in effect. We're doing about 500 samples a year. We're looking at 16 different products. We found some minor problems. We found some traces of drug, uh, and until recently, we had not run across one that was uh, a tanker truck that carried either sulfonamides, uh, tetracyclines, or the beta-lactams that were above uh, our level of concern. More recently, we have found one in the Midwest, and action is being taken to uh, correct that problem and to bring about whatever regulatory correction is necessary. We've been developing test methods. I think uh, it's been, we've been depicted incorrectly in saying that we don't like screening methods. We understand screening methods, and we understand screening methods place in a regulatory environment. But we also understand the importance of having a validated chemical method to use as a standard by which we can compare these screening methods to. And for that reason, we have had methodology development in both the chemical, the long, the costly chemical method, as well as in the screening methods. We haven't done as much as we'd like to do. We have now done, uh, we now have uh, three kits that have been reviewed in, uh, for, for screening method validity. And we're ready to pass those on to the states. We have also developed analytical methods for, for uh, in addition to that, 22 animal drug residues in milk, and we're working on 13 others. Uh, <clears throat> the commercial world knows that we, the FDA, and the Association of Analytical Chemists are in a position to evaluate their screening methods and make these methods available to the states. And that's taken some time to do that, but, but uh, we're not lazy and we're not dumb and we're not uncaring. We simply have to be sure things are done correctly before they're placed in the hands of, of regulatory officials. <clears throat> we continue to work with the American Associations of Bovine Practitioners and the American Veterinary Medical Association by assisting in the education of veterinarians about the requirements of the pasteurized milk ordinance. We've also worked with the National Milk Producers Federation and the American Veterinary Medical Association in development and implementation of their milk and dairy beef 10-point quality assurance program. That program is designed to avoid residues where they occur, and that's on the farm. We can continue to devote significant resources to training FDA regional milk specialists and state inspectors and sanitarians and rating officers. After that, we have to train then F, uh, uh, laboratory branch people, uh, and, and that is done by our laboratory quality assurance folks. So there's been an awful lot accomplished in the way of more testing, providing more methodology, and assuring that the milk supply is safe. Uh, we will do more, and we will continue to do more. And in the things that you point out to us and GAO points out to us, we'll work on those things. Uh, and, and, and we will make progress. Now, if I could, I'd like to turn just a moment to extra label use of veterinary drugs and, and the policy that has been talked about uh, uh, both in the congressional panel as well as in the GAO panel. 
we know that in 1968 Congress passed a law in Section 512 of the Federal Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act which says that use of a drug other than labeled is illegal. We understand that. <clears throat> we also know that the law required us in the approval process to make drugs available to laypersons if adequate directions for use could be written. And so 80% of the therapeutic drugs for use in food producing animals are legally sold over the counter. There is a specific exemption in the act that allows for prescription veterinary drugs and these are drugs for which uh, adequate directions for lay use cannot be written. Historically, veterinarians have in the course of their practice of medicine exercised judgment in utilizing therapeutic agents often going beyond the limits of what's said on the label. And for many years, the agency's policy was that a veterinarian could use whatever he or she could legally obtain. During the late 70s and early 80s, we recognized at the agency that there was a need for a more restrictive and a more structured policy. In 1984, we developed the first guidance to FDA inspectors, and this also applies to veterinarians and not producers, we developed the first guidance that would give some clarity about regulatory discretion and in, in the enforcement of that part of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. The veterinarian's role is described in that compliance policy guide. The agency lays out very clearly the bounds of the regulatory discretion to be used by our inspectors. Mr. Chairman, I personally believe that the extra label use position and in, in that compliance policy guide by the agency is necessary, given the, what the law says today. And I also believe that that extra label use position is sound public policy. The extra label drug use policy reiterates what the current, current law says, and it says to the veterinarian that you should be using drugs in an extra label way only when an animal's life is threatened or when an animal is suffering. Uh, I'm quite willing to tell, uh, to come down real hard on a veterinarian if she, he or she creates a drug residue because of that. I'm not near so willing to tell a veterinarian they cannot treat a sick animal. So I think that's the, the dilemma that we find ourselves in in the agency. It's not an easy issue but I'm convinced that the extra label drug use policy as it's now articulated by the agency is uh, better than no policy at all in this regard. We have recently upgraded that compliance policy guide. We've identified specific drugs which are not to be used in lactating dairy cows and we've also said that there must be specific labeling on that drug if a veterinarian feels the need because of animals' need and suffering. If the veterinarian feels the need to go extra label or off label, then there has to be some very clear labeling for the farmer to give the farmer directions about drug withdrawal times and how often, uh, when not to send the animal to slaughter and when not to, to make milk available for the commercial market. Uh, that particular revision was accomplished on July 20th, 1992. We've taken a number of other actions. Uh, we've relabeled all the sulfamethazine products to add warning statements about their prohibition uh, uh, in, in use in dairy cattle and in veal calves. We've taken two nitrofuran drugs off the market since the last time we were here. And as of June 1992, in, in, in our FDA ongoing bulk drug enforcement activities, there have been 44 guilty pleas involving five veterinarians, six import brokers, and two smugglers. And there have been over 30 felony pleas, 15 prison sentences, and over $1 million in sealed goods that were intended to be used in food producing animals. Mr. Dr. Chairman, Dr. would you uh, uh, summarize and conclude? I'm, I'm coming to the end, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in addition, we will be. Uh, initiating and establishing a new compliance policy guide uh, that will spell out clearly that extra label use is a privilege not extended to the lay user, that is not extended to the non-veterinarian. In conclusion, the national milk supply is one of FDA's most heavily regulated and monitored food commodities. 
I can assure you that we will strive to, to, to make things even better than they are today. Uh, I also submit to you that there is no crisis in terms of safety. There are things that we need to do, but there's much that's already been done since February of 1990. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Uh, we're going to uh, utilize the five-minute rule at this point uh, for questions. Um, let me start by asking you, late in 1990, FDA announced that it would, quote, launch a nationwide program to test raw milk for veterinary drug residues. Last year, this so-called nationwide program consisted of taking one annual sample on a supposedly random basis from 250 different processing plants. Is that correct? That, that program started uh, with uh, 250 samples. It's now up to 500 samples, Mr. Weiss. So that, that's two uh, for, per uh, processing plant, is that right? Or is, there, is it 500 processing plants? Well, there's a randomness to that uh, collection, and some plants uh, in, the, in the heavy producing areas might get hit more than once. I, I don't think that's, uh, we could say specifically it's one sample per plant. I, I think it's, uh, it's more random than that. Yeah, last year was 250 uh, plants, though. Is that correct? That's the information that we have from your December 27, 1990 it, it, statement. It could be correct, yes, right. if that's what you have from us. Right. FDA hoped that this national monitoring program would have a deterrent effect on the misuse of animal drugs. Is that true? Yes, and I think it does have a deterrent effect. If, if we don't know, uh, if we aren't sampling, it certainly can't have a deterrent effect. If uh, we're not looking for sulfonamides, which that program looks for, it certainly can't have a deterrent effect. If we're not looking for tetracyclines, which that uh, program looks for, it couldn't have a deterrent effect. So I'm, I'm convinced that no matter how, how many samples you're taking, it has a deterrent effect. For 1991, FDA obtained 234 samples and was only able to confirm one sample as containing a residue. Earlier this year, these results were reported publicly. Is that correct? Yes, sir. But, Dr. Guest, isn't it true that just a few months after this program began, FDA knew that some milk plants were being tipped off when samples were to be collected? Uh, perhaps I could... Uh Ask my colleagues to the right here if they have any information on that. Well, I, I've been from a July 16, 1991 meeting, uh, at, from, we have notes from you uh, where you stated, quote, plants being notified sufficiently advanced to make sure loads are negative. Regions say they don't want to be positive. How can we trust data? That's, the, that's a statement that was made by you at that. That was not made by, by me. FDA staff, I'm sorry. I don't know about that. But Anybody I, there know about it? No, I don't know anything about the circumstance, but, but I have heard that, that said, and uh, perhaps there's someone here at the table who can Please. help me with that. Mr. Chairman, uh, yeah. we became aware early in the program of two instances, I believe one in Florida, one in Wisconsin, in both cases, the inspectors were corrected, and uh, we believe the problem was very minimal. Uh, we have not, at, at least to my knowledge, uh, received any more reports. We don't think there was any intent by the inspector to alert the plant to, to divert their uh, materials, but only um, to tell them we were coming, and that was a mistake, but, but we have no reason to believe they did anything different than normal. Well, uh, the, the notes of a September 5, 1991 FDA meeting suggest that the agency did not wish to take direct action against the cheating. The notes indicate that FDA would release what it knew about possible cheating to the milk conference. Quote, let FDA stay out of it is the operative phrase in the notes from your meeting. Why did you decide to pass the buck and not take any action yourself? And how, how can you say that it had 
it had no effect when in fact it's supposed to be done randomly without the plant knowing when the inspection was going to take place if in fact they know in, in advance when the inspection is going to take place. We, we have to notify the states. I'm not, I'm not aware that the states notify the plants. Uh, we did, after we became aware of those two instances, reduce the lead time. The states have to have some advance notice. They're picking up the sample for us, and, and they have to plan their work. They are government employees, and so we do place some trust in a government employee uh, to do that. Well, okay, but now if you find that, that your trust has been abused, what do you do about it? In those two instances, the states told us that they made corrective action. I have no reason to believe the states uh, were less than truthful when they said they took those two investigators and, and, and you know, made the corrective actions there. And then uh, why do you have the, the operative phrase, let FDA stay out of it? I mean, why, why, does, why shouldn't FDA be involved in that? I'm not sure I understand the question there. Well, the, the notes indicate that the, the uh, attitude of the FDA seemed to be that uh, let somebody else deal with that problem, not our problem. When in fact, <laughs> whatever your national plan is, whatever its inherent worth or its potential inherently may be, if in fact your tr the trust that you place in the state agencies is misplaced, uh, then the plan can't work. Mr. Chairman, if I could offer this, um, from what I'm reading in the notes, the statement was that let the NCIMS board deal with possible cheating and let FDA stay out of it. That statement seems to have been made by a non-FDA individual, uh, or possibly by an FDA individual. But in any event, I think uh, the NCIMS board, um, this being a cooperative state federal cooperative program, uh, would be the appropriate place to sort that out with between the federal government, the states, and the, uh, and the industry. But this is an FDI, FDA monitoring program. This is the, the, the new national plan that you are so proud of and pleased with. I mean, it, it, it can't possibly work if, in fact, the, the uh, plants are tipped off in advance, no, ma no matter who, who tips them off, uh, that, that, in fact, the inspector is coming. Other than the two instances, Mr. Chairman, that, that uh, Mr. Nichols alluded to, we have no first-hand knowledge that anything else happened other than a statement by an individual, uh, which seems to be a statement of his opinion. Last August, that oh, my time is expired. Uh, Mr. Payne. Yes. Um, in the, uh, the GAO uh, report, um, there was a statement that farmers, non-veterinarians may copy extra label use by treating dairy cows with over-the-counter medications. Now, over-the-counter medications dispensed by veterinarians must adhere to specific labeling requirements. Uh, I wonder if anyone of you could elaborate on, on what regulatory action will be taken on failure to adhere to these labeling requirements on the part of farmers or vets. Well, over-the-counter drugs are used by veterinarians as well as by farmers, and, and prescription drugs are those that are controlled by the veterinarian but, but often dispensed to the farmer for use on his farm. So. Uh, the outcome either way would be the same if there's an extra label use involvement. If there's an extra label use involvement where the veterinarian's involved, uh, we contemplate that there'll be a lot more knowledge about the use of that drug and how to use it safely than if the layman has acted alone. 
Uh, in either case, if a drug residue is created, uh, we would come down the same on an extra label use as we would for a failure to withdraw the drug on a on a non extra label situation. So, uh, in the f in the first case, if if meat or milk, uh, in the case of meat, if if there were a violation, uh, that particular farmer would be notified and the farm visited, uh, depending on the seriousness of the problem. Uh, in the case of milk, uh, what you've heard earlier is that milk caught with a violative residue is dumped. So there, there is a penalty for creating a drug residue by the extra label use or, or, or other means. Mm -hmm. hey, um, uh, earlier we heard that um, uh, there are some persons from, from dairy producing areas uh, felt that the industry could sufficiently uh, police themselves. And um, I, I just wonder, uh, what is your opinion as to, uh, since we know it's impossible to, uh, to uh, uh, check all, all the milk that uh, takes samples, since it's such a large quantity, uh, what has been your uh, experience with the industry and its ability to uh, to self-police itself? I think with this uh, particular commodity as well as with a lot of others that greater and greater industry involvement is needed for quality assurance of the product. I think there is a government role, but I think the government cannot possibly test every lot for everything that might possibly occur. So I, I uh, as a, an individual, am very much in, uh, in favor of more and more industry quality control programs. There, there seems to be a, a move for more and more uh, reliance on, on the industry. Um, uh, we, we heard uh, some discussion some months ago about the uh, vice president's um, uh, committee on competitiveness where the allowance of uh, certain uh, pharmaceutical drugs could be approved at maybe half the time. Uh, there also seem to be a, um, a uh, uh, what, I'm, what, what I'm trying to get to, I, and maybe I'll just ask the question, is do, do the independent agencies, uh, your agency, have uh, the flexibility to simply make determinations that you feel happens to be best for the industry? And well, I'll use it as an example, uh, in Rio there was seemingly from the uh, EPA uh, director a particular feeling that there should be a certain position that we should have because of the environment, but it seemed that there were some conflicting uh, and overriding positions that came from somewhere other than EPA. Uh, is, is there any uh, uh, collaboration between other departments as it relates to FDA as it happened in that EPA example? Oh, I, I've never felt any overriding influences outside of the judgments we make within our, our budgets and within our priorities. I think we have a clear mandate uh, to enforce the, the law, and I think we, we do that within the constraints that we have as far as resources are concerned, and I don't feel that anybody is trying to take the science in a different direction. Uh, I've never felt that. Mm -hmm. I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks. Uh, very quickly, one of them I won't ask you to give me today, but since Mr. Weiss brought it up, I'm kind of interested to know how many boxes of material that are thought necessary to snow Mr. Weiss with, with paper and about um, how much cost that might be and how many people were involved in, uh, how many offices were disseminated. So if you'd send me a letter to that effect, yes, sir, we'd be I'd glad like to, to know um, about that. Second item. Uh, very quickly, at some point, I'd like you to, exp uh, and I've got some sort of meeting I've got to go to, but in the testimony I heard before, there seems to be um, one test which is fairly expensive called HPCL, 
which um, apparently does all things for all things. Uh, and then there's the channel one and channel two and other types of, uh, or charm, I'm sorry, charm one and charm two tests which do certain other things but are less costly in screening at the site. Then there may be other tests. Why is there this delay? I think most of us tend to trust the milk su supply, uh, certainly. And if there are other tests that would improve that uh, feeling, why can't we get them out there? Uh, we, th we think we should get them out there faster, too, uh, Mr. Hobson. We're, uh, the reason we're continuing to develop the more expensive, more sophisticated HPLC kinds of tests is that we do need a standard by which we can measure these tests that are on the market, uh, uh, test kits. Test kits are not, uh, aren't required to be cleared by anyone before they come into the marketplace. So once they're in the marketplace, if they're going to be used for regulatory purposes, we have to make certain they're measuring what they should be measuring. The worst situation would be to have a test in the marketplace uh, that was, was, was not picking up what it should be picking up, in other words, false negatives. That, that would be a bad circumstance. Well, we, in other areas, we, we have false negatives, and so when you find those, you do another test. Uh, why, why can't you develop, I mean, in the area of HIV, we, we don't have a perfect first test, uh, so we do a cheapy test, and, or it's considered relatively cheap, and then we do uh, uh, the, um, the next step, which is a more expensive test after that. Is that the kind of thing you're going but, to, or can we get there? Well, with a screening test, you can sort out the false pos positives and decide if that was a valid positive. If you get a negative, the milk goes on and you, you, you don't have any reason to follow up on it with the next test. So, so my point is that we probably seem slow and we probably seem unconcerned, but we want those tests to be correct. And, and we have now finished the three kits that I talked about. Those are being made available to the states. They do test for the drugs that are most widely used uh, in, in uh, dairy practice. So we're not happy, but yet we're making progress, I guess, is the answer. I, I guess, though, if Mr. Weiss were asking this question, he would say, err on the side of health. Err on the side of that which protects the public versus Dollars, and and I, I think that's that would I think we would all share that concern, and, and I think if the effort is on the side of dollars, then I think that's wrong, and I think we ought to look at the side that is the most cost, still not not I don't want to be non-cost effective, but on the other side, you've got to err on the side of the health of the public, if it, and, and I think that is the question that that's being raised. But I guess I would urge you. Um, to be as fast, at least uh, be working on this in a way that it does not, that is not dilatory and certainly does not appear, appear to be dilatory. And thirdly, I'd just like to quickly ask you, is there any comment you'd like to make about the GAO? Well, you may not want to make them all, but is there any comment that you would like to make uh, about the GAO report uh, at this point that uh, you'd like to, to talk about? Well, uh, there, there's not much we can say having not seen it earlier. Uh, That's but, why I'm asking you. Is, is uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, the auditors were with us uh, the better part of two years, spending a lot of time looking at... When did at you get the report? Excuse me. When did you see the report in its completed form? Oh, uh, this, this, I haven't opened the page yet. I, uh, we picked it up from the table over here uh, to my left. So we, this morning is the answer to your question. Okay, you, but you've had no conference with the GAO about the report prior to today? I mentioned that in June, we saw a draft report without any conclusions or without any recommendations. But the, the first time you've seen the, the conclusions and the recommendations are this morning? Well, the first time we've had them in our hands, I haven't had a chance to read them because the hearing had started by the time uh, we, we got them. So it, we're at a disadvantage. We feel a little bit ambushed by that. Mr. But Mr. Hobson, you'd be pleased to know, perhaps, 
that the first time we saw it was yesterday. The final draft, the final copy. Okay. Um, okay, if the, uh, my time is about up, but if you've got any other comment about the re what you think is in the report uh, or what you're able to discern, uh, you, you, you can continue if you like, or if you'd rather wait and uh, make any comment later for the record, I, I'm sure the chairman would appreciate receiving that. We would like to do that later for the record once we've had a chance to review the report. Thank okay. you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You, chairman. Uh, you did have a three-day uh, exit conference with GAO back in June, is that right? It was a three-day session on, on the on, on June 29th, we had an exit conference that lasted the, into the next day and the next day. Right. And then all the way through the month of July, there were phone calls and discussions. We, right. we didn't see the conclusions. We didn't see the recommendations. They weren't shared with us. We assumed that the report changed during the month of July because there was so much discussion. But we don't know that for sure, Mr. Weiss. Right. Okay. Um, let me uh, go back to where uh, I, I stopped the questioning before, where you had, I think, Dr. Archer, you had said that you only know of uh, two instances uh, in which uh, there was this information uh, tipped in advance. Uh, isn't it a fact that uh, there was a request for a draft audit plan to determine whether, in fact, it went beyond those two instances. Are you aware of that? Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have any first-hand knowledge of that. I'm, I'm, perhaps Mr. Nichols does. Um, well, if, 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 you will, if you have a copy, if not, we'll, set, we'll give it to you. Uh, there is a uh, date assigned 7-16-91, due date 9-5-91. The requester is Dr. Mitchell. Uh, and it says, this is a request for a draft audit plan. The plan, if executed, is to determine if information about the milk sampling site and dates is known to individuals at the sampling site uh, who, call, who could direct, divert antibiotic residue tanker uh, milk to avoid being sampled in the FDA NDR MF. MMP. Now, the question is, was there such a, an audit plan drafted? Mr. Chairman, this uh, request was made uh, of an individual in our staff here uh, in uh, surveillance and compliance in September of last year. That was the, at the time that the uh, information that you've already spoken with uh, to Dr. Archer, close to, you. to Dr. Archer and, and Mr. Nichols uh, was uh, when those assertions were being made. And uh, following that uh, period of, of assertions, and those two in particular, there were no further uh, findings or observations uh, that came to my attention, at least, of any such uh, uh, diversion of, uh, of trucks from one site to another for purposes of avoiding a sample under the National Drug Residue Milk Monitoring Program. And in answer to your question, no, there never has been a draft audit plan written. Well, you, it was a sufficient concern so that you made this request, right? That is correct. And you said that uh, the due date is September 5, 91. Uh, you say you don't know of any other. Have you tried to find out if there were any other uh, information diverted, any, any other uh, tips, tipping off situations? And that's one question. And two, why wasn't the assignment carried out? We were very acutely attuned to further allegations uh, all during this period. And no further uh, information of that nature 
came to our attention. And in the absence of further uh, need and in consideration of other work that needed to be carried out, this draft plan was never prepared. The, that's, that's very strange. I mean, here you tell me that, that uh, with great pride about this new national monitoring plan. And then you tell me that, that you get information about uh, two instances where there is a tipping off in advance to the plant as to when the inspectors are coming. And you tell me that there is sufficient concern on your part that it may go beyond those two instances that you make an assignment returnable on September 5th that uh, there be a draft audit plan. And that draft audit plan is what's supposed to find out for you whether in fact there are any other instances. Instead, you decide on the basis of vibrations that you get from God knows where that in fact there is nothing else out there without the benefit of that plan being implemented. I don't understand that. Why? Well, uh, those vibrations, uh, Mr. Chairman, are, I think, uh, through the Food and Drug and Field Organization, rather extensive through regional milk specialists and FDA inspectors throughout the country. Uh, and through our surveillance uh, at uh, professional meetings and by staff who are attending those meetings that uh, if there were other reports of diversion of this nature that we would in fact have heard something about them. And so you didn't, you didn't request a follow-through, you didn't insist on a follow-through of the draft audit plan because you were willing to accept an informal uh, vibration system to tell you whether in fact there were problems or not, with, instead of going at it methodically. That is correct at this moment. That's not to say that we would not at some point in the future prepare that draft plan and offer it for approval. Thank you. Uh, my, my time has expired. Mr. Payne? I have no uh, further questions, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Last August, at a meeting to plan the 1992 monitoring program, FDA officials discussed the need to collect milk samples randomly at any time during the day. This would avoid the problem in 1991 when the program required and plants probably knew that the milk was to be taken from the first truck that arrived after the inspector was set up to take the sample. Isn't that true? Yes, sir, that is true. However, the 1992 plan still requires the milk to be taken from the first truck that arrives after the inspector is ready to take the sample. Why didn't you change the program to collect samples randomly during the day? Uh, your question again, Mr. Chairman? The 1992 plan still requires the milk to be taken from the first truck that arrives after the inspector is ready to take the sample. Why didn't you change the program to collect samples randomly during the day? Why did we change... Why did you not change the program to collect samples randomly rather than automatically taking the first truck that arrives after the inspector is ready to take the uh, sample. The, the randomness uh, of that sample is that uh, the inspector uh, arrives at a random point during the day. And so we require in that program that the sample be collected as soon as he's set up to take it. That eliminates the judgment factor from the inspector's uh, well, in, and what he in, can do. In a memorandum dated August 29th, on page two, uh, says we next discussed the, the next to the last paragraph on the bottom of page two. 
We next discussed the recommended number of samples to be collected for the fiscal year 92 program. I'll skip a couple of sentences and it says, trucks would be randomly sampled at any time during the day, not the first truck that arrives after the inspector is set up to take the sample as in the grade A sampling plan for fiscal year 1991. So that the, the very uh, randomness that you say was built in because of when the inspector arrived randomly during the day was, was, was to be discarded, was not to be utilized at all, that it would be done randomly at any time during the day rather than the first truck after the, the inspector arrived. Could I get the chance to read that? Pardon? Could I read that statement, of course. please? bottom of page two, you'll see some yellow, uh, oh, the, la the last sentence in the next to the last paragraph, trucks would be randomly. Mr. Chairman, this appears to be a, a, a document describing a meeting where a lot of ideas are, are thrown around. Uh, some of the ideas, of course, are accepted and others are not. Uh, I'm not a statistician, and, and the statistician that was with us there was the one that made this um, suggestion and, and as Dr. Mitchell has previously said there is some randomness to to just whenever the in, inspector uh, shows up. Right, so you didn't make the change at all because the fiscal 92 uh, plan in fact provides uh, quote the inspector will obtain the sample from the first truck that arrives after the inspector is ready to collect the sample. That's correct, it, the, the change was not made um, after this discussion. Another problem with last year's program was noted in the February 1992 FDA memorandum, which stated that, quote, samples are only collected on Monday and Tuesday, and some are concerned that this is widely known by the industry. GAO informed, close quote, GAO informed the subcommittee that samples are still being collected only on the first few days of the week. Doesn't this compromise the random nature of your program? Mr. Chairman, I don't think we have said that uh, that's a totally randomized program, but that is necessary because of, of uh, the way the laboratory works. But I can tell you that milk is the kind of commodity that you can't decide to hold it for three or four days because the sample is going to be taken at the milk plant. So uh, I, I don't think there's near as serious a problem indicated there as, as it might sound. Yeah. Milk continues to come in every day at a processing plant. It can't be held on the farm for an indefinite period of time. And I don't think that the, uh, the intelligence uh, among the, uh, the intelligence gathering systems would, would cause that to bias at all that program. Well, it, it, it certainly reduces uh, the, the randomness, if, if you're only doing it on Mondays and Tuesdays, or Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Wednesday, rather than on five days a week, that, that's less of a randomness than, than you otherwise would have. I wish we could 
check every tanker of milk every day I'm not day suggesting that week. you check every tanker and, of milk. And we, we just simply aren't set up in a matter, with a matter of our resources to do that. And there are certain practicalities to the programs that we just have to live with. And I, I, I agree with you 100 percent. I just don't know how to fix it uh, very easily. GAO stated in its report that your program is so flawed that it is impossible to draw any conclusion about the presence or absence of animal drug residues in milk. Some at FDA seem to agree. One senior FDA official recently wrote that the monitoring program, quote, as presently constructed, will not answer the question about the safety of the nation's milk supply, close quote. Given all of these problems, what assurances can FDA give consumers that this monitoring program can possibly tell the public anything about the extent of residues in milk? I think you have to look at the milk program altogether, Mr. Chairman. You can't simply say, well, you only test 500 samples of milk, so that, uh, that's not enough. You've got to look at the fact that there are on-the-farm inspectors who check drug cabinets. You've got to look at the fact that the industry does testing, the states do testing. We have some private individuals and organizations doing testing. I think it was mentioned this morning that uh, in, in uh, Consumer Reports in May, there was a report of a survey they did on 160 shelf milk samples, and they found uh, trace amounts in 2% of those samples, not amounts that would be worrisome. So I, I think that, you have to take the program back looking and, and at the program that, altogether that before, you can, before you can make the judgment that everything is, is wrong. There, in, in my view, we need to do more, we need to work more, uh, but, but there is no crisis of safety. None of the tools that we have would indicate that there is that crisis of safety. Well, again, the quote that I gave you uh, was, as I said, from a senior uh, FDA official, and it appears in a June 25, 1992 letter written by James T. Peeler from the Office of the Director of the Center for Food Safety and Applied Nutrition. Uh, at this point, we have a vote on the floor, and so we're going to take a recess for that, as well as uh, we're going to squeeze lunch in at the same time. Uh, the cafeteria on the B floor at, in Rayburn is open. Uh, we will resume at 2.30. The subcommittee stands in recess. Again, my apologies. Just at the time, <clears throat> just at the time we're about to resume, we had a series of votes. Hopefully, we're all right now for a while. <clears throat> the subcommittee is now back in session. <clears throat> <clears throat> <clears throat> On February 25, 1992, FDA wrote that as a result of this, of the new testing requirements under the milk ordinance, quote, states report that between three to four times more milk is being identified and reported by industry as contaminated, close quote. However, as earlier noted, this new testing covers only four out of the 82 drugs that can be used on dairy cows. The subcommittee has learned that even for this limited testing, during the first three months of 1992, nearly one million pounds of beta-lactam tainted milk was dumped in New York State, over 800,000 pounds in Minnesota, and over 11 million pounds in Wisconsin. Now, Dr. Guest, don't these figures suggest that beta-lactams are being misused by the dairy industry? Well, I think it suggests that, that uh, people are not uh, withdrawing the drug or not withholding milk uh, as they should be. Uh, but the beta-lactams uh, generally are approved for use in dairy cattle. It's probably just uh, a matter of, of uh, mistaken use or improper use. Right. 
In fact, FDA wrote on February 25, 1992, that, quote, this is going to result in a phenomenal amount of milk being destroyed until we either get the problem resolved by keeping drug-contaminated milk out of the food chain or find another use for contaminated milk, close quote. How many hundreds of millions of pounds of milk would be dumped if any of the 78 other drugs known to be used on milk cows were subjected to mandatory testing? Well, I, I don't think we have a, a figure on that. That would just be some sort of conjecture. There are many of those uh, that aren't tested for that probably if you and I live to be 100 years old, we wouldn't want to test for just simply because they aren't used often enough or they don't have a toxicological uh, picture that would cause us to want to test for it. So uh, there, prob there are a number of drugs that we're developing methods so that we'll be able to test for, but certainly it doesn't approach 82. Uh, th there just aren't that many we're concerned about, uh, Mr. Weiss. Well, that, that's nice to hear. Uh, FDA provided the subcommittee with a May 13, 1992 letter from Charles Murphy, the director of Georgia's Dairy Inspection Program, to the head of the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shipments. Mr. Murphy wrote that FDA is, quote, doing their usual job of not fully confronting the problems and trying to pass the buck to the state agencies. Most states are frustrated by the lack of leadership, slow progress, and lack of ability to answer these difficult questions by FDA. I have spoken with several members of the NCIMS executive board and also many state delegates, and they agree on most of these issues, close quote. Why are you ignoring the states and continuing to place such a high priority on laboratory tests that are basically useless to state inspectors? Well, I, I don't know about the letter or the memo that you just talked about. Uh, perhaps if we could see a copy of it, we, we could be more responsive. It's a uh, letter dated uh, May 13, 1992, um, and uh, the on page two, paragraph number uh, nine covers the area as well as the line just below the paragraph just below it that I touched on. This is from your files, Dr. Well, the, uh, the letter is addressed to uh, Mr. Alfred Place, who's the chairman of the National Conference on Interstate Milk Shipments. I guess if, uh, if there is an individual in the program like Charles Murphy who feels this way, then we ought to try to deal with that. But on the other hand, uh, I haven't ever spoken to Mr. Murphy about this. Well, he says that most states are frustrated by the lack of leadership, slow progress, and lack of ability to answer these difficult questions well, by FDA. Well, that's just sort of an opinion or a generalization. I, d I don't know if all sh states share that or not. I, I, I don't like it. I don't even like one state worrying about that. But on the other hand, uh, we'll try to deal with it. Uh, it it's a fairly recent occurrence. and. Uh, I think uh, what I would suggest we do is we go back to this individual and see if we can find out what's frustrating him and, and try to help because this whole thing can't work unless there's a partnership between us and the states and the industry. And for this thing to work, we've got to be very upfront with each other. So if, if this person feels like there's a lack of leadership uh, on the FDA side, I hope we can address that and we'll be glad but, to but do that. But Dr. Guest, isn't that really the problem? This is this person, his, this Charles H. Murphy, is the director of the dairy division of the Department of Agriculture of the state of Georgia. He's not speaking in an individual capacity. He's speaking as a state official. Uh, 
and for you to consider that this is fairly recent because it's the middle of May of 1992 when we're now moving on to the middle of August is, is an indication again of I think the lackadaisical attitude that the FDA has about this problem. Well I, I don't agree with that but certainly uh, we'll look into it and, and, and if there's some corrections that need to be made we'll do that. Mr. Murphy indicated that the number one test most states are using is not sufficiently sensitive and thus cannot confirm positive screening test results from the milk industry. This problem apparently did not concern the chairman of the NCIMS who in an earlier letter to Mr. Murphy wrote, quote, the scenario you cite is that we may not be able to confirm a positive screening test reported by industry. If there is no confirmation, there is no positive result and no regulatory action is required. So where is the risk? Close quote. Does FDA share the see, hear, and speak no evil enforcement philosophy? No. Uh, GAO reported today that FDA's extra label drug use policy contributes to the problem of animal drug residues in milk. Wasn't it FDA's intent that extra label drug use would only occur rarely? I'm sorry, is that a question, sir? Yeah. Wasn't it FDA's intent that extra label drug use would only occur rarely? Yeah, we've said when there's no other drug available and an animal has a, a problem with a disease that's causing suffering or death, that that drug should be used. We hope it won't be used any more often than is necessary. Okay, and, and in fact, you said in a statement in, on November 19th of 1991 that uh, extra label use should be done infrequently. You, you, you adhere to that position, is that right? Done in what, sir? I'm sorry. Infrequently. It should be done infrequently. Yes, I would hope so. Yeah. Now, FDA now concedes that the extra label use of animal drugs is widespread and prevalent. Isn't that true? Well, I think there's a lot more extra label use going on than we had liked, just simply because veterinarian, uh, veterinary medicine has moved faster than, than the approval process. So there is more going on than we'd prefer. GAO reported today that FDA's extra label drug use policy undermines the agency's control of dr drugs for food producing animals and may discourage drug companies from getting these uses properly approved. FDA seems to be well aware of this problem. In an October 9, 1991 memorandum, <clears throat> FDA acknowledged that one criticism of the policy is that it, quote, circumvents the animal drug approval system and discourages development of new uses for animal drugs. Does FDA agree with this criticism? No, not totally, sir. Why not? Well, I think we, we recognize that extra-label drug use is a problem and a dilemma, <clears throat> but, but it's not one of the agencies making. I think it's an issue that needs to be confronted uh, from a public policy standpoint. Uh, we know that there is no chance that for every disease condition in every animal species that we'll have uh, approved drugs for, for every circumstance. So uh, with that being the case, uh, we have felt compelled to try to place some priority on our enforcement. Uh, we do know that most of the drug residues that have occurred, and this is because of our follow-up to drug residue uh, findings and tests, we know that most drug residues come from mistakes made by the animal producer themselves and not by the veterinarian. So I don't think our policy contributes to a safety problem. I think, in fact, if we drop that policy and we took away the focus of that policy so that extra label use went underground, I think we would have created more of a public health problem than, than we would have with the policy. So I, I, uh, I tend to think uh, that, that what we've done is responsible and reasonable. But if a drug company can make millions via extra label sale, what's the incentive to get these drugs properly approved? 
Well, I think there is a disincentive, but there are a number of uses uh, of, for drugs in, in animal medicine where the, the, the profits don't nearly approach millions of dollars. We're talking, if, if in, in some circumstances, we're talking very small amounts of money for conditions that do not occur often enough, the drug isn't used often enough, and, and I think probably if we're to cure that problem, on the public uh, on the public debate side, we need to be talking about incentives to allow for more drug approvals and and mechanisms for to allow for more drug approvals because the economics in many cases just simply doesn't support going for a full blown approval in An internal FDA task force reviewed the extra-label drug use policy earlier this year. In its report to you, Dr. Guest, the task force stated that the possibility of unsafe residues in food and the resulting effect on human health was the primary reason FDA is concerned about the extra-label drug use policy. Is that correct? I think the very reason we have that policy is for that reason, Mr. Weiss. We have that policy to try to avoid and prevent drug residues. That policy defines proper drug use by the veterinarian. And if he or she follows that, we shouldn't have a public health problem. But you know that the FDA, the GAO says that some veterinarians have told them that 85% of the animal drugs that they dispense are for extra label use. Are you aware of that? No, I have no knowledge of that, that kind of percentage. One FDA official put it pretty bluntly when he wrote in October 1991 that, quote, if an approved product is used in an extra label manner, all assurances of safety and effectiveness are void. Do you agree with that assessment of the problem? No, because the person using that drug can, can certainly use some judgment about how, it, how it's used. I think the labeling is guidance to the individual using the drug, but I would suspect that sometimes you take three aspirin instead of two, and that's an extra label use. And, and, and we, can't, we can't possibly have an inspector beside every cow. So, the first line of defense in preventing a drug residue has got to be with the animal producer and the veterinarian at the farm level. And, and so I don't think that uh, the absence of labeling is any excuse not to do something in a responsible way. I wish we had labels <clears throat> for every conceivable use of a drug. That would be the ideal circumstance. We probably aren't going to get there. I wish we could do it. I wish we could come down hard every time somebody causes an illegal residue. The system doesn't allow that. But it's four, four out of 82? I'm sorry? Four out of 82? Is that, does that satisfy you? Well, we can talk about those 82 drugs a, a little bit if you want to, because in, in the way that list was gathered and, and the importance of those drugs there. Well, how, ma how many of them would you say are really problems in your estimation? Well, we, we test for in our milk monitoring system, there's four in the, on the industry side, there's, a, there's 16, four of which, let's see, there's an additional 12 drugs that are monitored for mm -hmm. in the National Drug Residue Milk Monitoring Program. That gives us a very good indication of, of, of what kind of contamination is going on. If one looks through the 82 drugs, and I was very disappointed uh, in the GAO report uh, that I had a chance to look at over the noontime. On page 60, the chart of the 82 drugs has a column, uh, the third column in that uh, particular report says, uh, it's a commonly used or it's a residue of concern. Uh, and, and that's all in one column, and they simply put X's uh, beside the drug that might have been commonly used or might create a residue of concern. There's quite a lot of difference in whether something is commonly used and it doesn't create a residue of concern and whether it does. I, I was rather disappointed in the handling of, of, of this because you can't, all drugs aren't created equal. You can't simply look down a list of drugs because it was found one time in a medicine cabinet at a dairy farm 
and say number one that it's commonly used and number two you can't decide that because it is used that it's a problem there are a number of these drugs that 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 might be an analgesic they might be an anesthetic that's used very seldom in an animal's life there may be other things on here that are used for breeding or calving purposes <clears throat> that might never have the potential for causing a drug residue. So you, you can't say 82 drugs and that they're all the same. We have to prioritize. Well, that's precisely the point I asked you to give me your estimation of, of, the, of the most hazardous or dangerous ones. And I assume that, the, that these 12 that are being tested in addition to the four beta lactams are the ones that are part of this new national plan yes. where the cheating uh, allegedly went on, where you had the draft plan, uh, auditing plan, uh, not done because of, of vibrations uh, that other people were getting. Uh, and where you can't really be sure at this point, except for those vibes, as to the accuracy of uh, those reports. And so, you know, I, I assume that it, this, this is where you have sulfur drugs and tetracyclines and uh, the carcinogens, what's, what's this? Pardon? sulfamethazine, uh, the other was chlorophenicol, you know, whole host of it. But what, what concerns me is that there is no real follow-through on that monitoring. There really is not. And, uh, you know, all of your, your, your pride in, in this new national plan, I think, is misplaced. I must tell you. The... Uh, earlier this year, at the request of the AVMA, Legislation was introduced to legalize the practice of prescribing drugs on an extra-label basis. There are some who feel that any legislation in this area must contain incentives for animal drug manufacturers to get more drugs properly approved by FDA. Dr. Guest, you are on record as saying that this legislation does not provide incentives for animal drug manufacturers to get more drugs approved by FDA. Is that correct? Yeah, I'd like to see something uh, along those lines. Uh, We've taken no position on the bill, uh, but I think it's an issue that has to be debated. I think it's an issue that I'm delighted that something's been introduced in the Congress that will bring about that debate. A May 26, 1992 uh, FDA memorandum refers to the Senate version of the AVMA legislation. This memo indicates that you do not think that FDA should actively support this bill and that the bill, quote, falls short of achieving a solution to the problem, close quote. Why, in your opinion, does the bill fail to solve the problem? Well, I think if you go on and read that memo, and that's not my memo, that was a reflection by a staffer after having had a conversation with me, and, and that was her interpretation of what I had said. And, and I've mentioned before that we have no position on that particular bill. We've, wor we've met seven times in the last two years, maybe 11 times, I forget the number, with, with consumer groups and the American Vet Medical Association to try to understand each other's position on extra label use. Extra label use is a problem, but it's not one of the agencies making. And veterinary medicine is moving along, advances are being made. We need to find, find ways of accommodating that. We need to find ways of, of, of assuring the consumer that drugs can be used properly and that residues won't be harmful. We need to find ways of, of cranking in the animal drug industry through some incentives to get more drugs approved. It's a complex and multifaceted issue, and I don't want to pass judgment on anyone's opinion about it, except I'm delighted that the thing has come to the front, and I hope that you'll participate and weigh in and and everybody that has something to to do with this will because our agency needs some help on this and and we don't need to constantly be bashed about it we need help about it well so what you, what you're telling me is that uh, Judy Riggins who uh, wrote this memo on the base of a conversation 
with you and sent it on to to uh, Mr. Taylor, Mike Taylor, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Policy, in which he says that uh, Dr. Guest said that he does not think that the FDA should actively support this bill. Uh, he said that he is encouraged by the public debate that has been triggered by the bill, but that this particular bill fails, falls sh uh, short of achieving a solution to the problem. Uh, you, you're saying that uh, that's not your position. Well, you need to read on. Uh, Dr. Guest said that industry has said that it can support the present bill, but would like to work in earnest with the AVMA to develop a bill that both could support. What I'm saying is that there were other opinions, and when our deputy commissioner asked me about it, I said, let's don't do anything right now. Let's don't be proactive right now. We need to watch and see how that debate sorts out. Well, because you say it falls short of achieving a solution. It's because of the incentives and other things that I think could be made a part of that whole uh, process. Yeah, well, you know, the, uh, the, the things that, that you say ought to be done and that FDA has to do to really uh, put the public's mind at rest and to uh, truly demonstrate the uh, safety of the uh, milk product, uh, that, that's really what these hearings have been about. But again, I must tell you that uh, the FDA's record looked at objectively, uh, not on the basis of uh, your interpretation, because obviously your, you and your agency are caught up in dealing with this issue, and you wouldn't be doing it if you didn't think what you were, do were doing was right. Uh, but uh, looked at objectively, it is very hard to see where that can, there can be any reassurance. I think that the, FD, the GAO is correct. Uh, it may be that the, the milk uh, supply is absolutely pure and it's absolutely safe. On the other hand, it may be that the milk supply is not safe, that it may in fact contain dangerous uh, materials, residues. Uh, and the FDA has really not done enough to demonstrate either. And that's not really what, what you were put into uh, office for or that the legislation under which FDA operates was created. And uh, it really concerns me that uh, we've been raising the, these issues for, in, in this committee for a dozen years and seem to have gotten a very s short distance. Uh, I, I appreciate that you're concerned about this. You're devoting your, your career to this issue, and I know that. But I must tell you that you have to sort of step back and look at yourselves from the point of view of the people whom you're supposed to be helping, the American people and the milk industry. And I'm not sure that you're doing a favor to either group at the stage of the game. Uh, if you have any closing comment that you would like to make, I invite you to do that. If you want to submit any statement, you're welcome to do that. Before I call on you to do that, let me recognize Mr. Payne for any closing statement he may have. Just <clears throat> sort of in line of questioning that you were following the uh, the fact that two and a half years ago we had some very serious concerns and uh, we had a very lengthy hearing at that time and we were really looking for uh, progress. I recall stating that it's an industry that is uh, well regarded, that it's, uh, it's uh, one of our uh, top uh, um, agricultural uh, uh, it's a good example of what we can do when we work together. But <clears throat> then to hear uh, the reports, the GAO report that uh, shows that actually in two and a half years there's there's very little progress. Um, and then when we talk in terms of uh, us, the state, and the industry doing this job together, I think that you know it certainly needs just leadership. I think is what we 
we keep hearing around the country the the lack of leadership and and uh, we realize that it's not a simple matter to ensure that that milk pro that milk is is uh, free of any kind of contamination but by the same token unless we move towards a goal uh, of attempting to be in better shape this year than we were two and a half years ago and uh, from the report that I've received here looking through the the report from the GAO there's still some serious question uh, as to whether progress is being made and we are all uh, recognizing that uh, as President Reagan said everybody will do more with less and so I'm sure that you're doing that but um, we uh, it's tough to get less with with less we unless we need then to to uh, have a serious request for additional assistance and then that's something that we need to deal with as as legislators but uh, we have a very important industry we we have some very serious concerns and it simply appears as though the same concerns that we have here on this side of the desk uh, seem to be somewhat different than the concerns on your side of the desk. It may be that you have many, many concerns, and this may simply be one of the many, but to us it's very important. And uh, I would hope that it would not be two and a half years later that we would hear that we're, we're still filling around with the four uh, particular drugs and looking at 12, but hoping that the industry will sort of, uh, uh, you know, monitor itself. As I indicated, we've, we've seen unsuccessful self-monitoring in the 80s, and we've seen the move towards profit and, and the big part of the 80s of the greed and so forth. Uh, is certainly something when we think back of the 80s that's what we're going to remember and I would just hope that the uh, that we could come up with some kind of resolution in order to uh, protect a very valuable uh, industry and to simply clear up any kind of questions uh, at least work towards clearing them up because it's we realize it's, it's not an easy it's not an easy task, and no one said it would be easy. Uh, but we did expect to get a little bit more progress uh, than we did, uh, than, than what I've been hearing at this time. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you very much, Mr. Payne. Dr. Guest, whatever comment you would care to make in closing. Well, thank you very much. I, um, we will continue to strive to do better. I noticed that uh, the GAO report talks about strategic planning and uh, we think we do that, but we will go back and, and revisit that. Uh, even though we'll continue to try to do better, I think probably the words that you spoke and the words that Dr. Michael Jacobson spoke at the hearing in February of 1990 uh, were words to the effect that you thought the milk supply was safe, but it could be safer. We're dedicated to making that safer. If you think, uh, or if anybody thinks that, that we aren't doing that, we're concerned about it and we want to move forward. The kinds of risk that are talked about in the GAO report, now that I've had a chance to look at it over the lunch hour, uh, would suggest allergic reactions, immune response reactions, uh, long-term problems with cancer. The kinds of uh, random, low-level, uh, kinds of residues that occasionally occur in the milk supply aren't likely to do uh, all of those things. Uh, probably the one thing that we need to worry most about are allergies. And people who are bothered by penicillin allergies, that's a very serious concern and we'll continue to work on it. That's one reason the four beta-lactams are looked at uh, most closely because the the other toxicological manifestations are much less likely to occur. Uh, we're not complacent about that, but on the other hand, uh, we do think that the milk supply is safe. Well, but, but that, that's really based on, I think, uh, 
wish fulfillment rather than scientific knowledge. Isn't that true? N no, sir. I, I, I try mean, to you, base What, what can you point to which, which in fact demonstrates that the milk supply is safe? Well, I think I mentioned earlier, the whole program as a whole has to be looked at. And you have to look at the experience that we have had with milk, the kind of testing that's been done, the on-the-farm visits. I don't feel, I wish I could be at every farm for every day, but we can't do that. And, and we're simply going to do the best we can given the priorities in this program. And we'll continue to strive to, to work in that direction. We'll be responding to the, to the GAO report. We'll be taking those recommendations seriously. Those are things that we will do because we feel seriously about this program. And, and will you also expedite getting a uh, tanker site and site uh, uh, presence for, of testing done so that in fact you don't have this costly laboratory kind of situation? Yes, sir. We, we will certainly do that. We feel the same way you do about screening tests. Yeah. Okay. Well, I thank you very much for taking so much time from your busy schedules to be with us, and we will obviously be uh, continuing to uh, follow this issue with, with uh, great concern and great interest. Uh, there is no product more broadly used and more highly touted than milk, and uh, I, for one, am not satisfied that it's good enough that just because nothing has happened, uh, we can be assured that, in fact, the milk supply is safe. Because I can, I can assure you that if, if we suddenly get an outbreak of some kind, which is traceable to milk, you're going to be hearing about it nationwide. And uh, it seems to me that just to prevent that kind of thing, you would want to move forward more expeditiously than, than the agency has been. Thank you very much. Appreciate your participation. Our fourth and final panel of witnesses represents the milk industry and veterinarians. The first witness is Jerome J. Kozak, Vice President of the Milk Industry Foundation. Following Mr. Kozak will be Senator John Melcher, who is appearing on behalf of the American Veterinary Medical Association. Senator Melcher is accompanied by Dr. Christine Kamen. Um, As I explained earlier, it is the custom of our committee to swear in all witnesses. So all of you who are going to be providing testimony would please stand behind your respective nameplates. Uh, please raise your right hands. And do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Let the record indicate that each of the witnesses has responded in the affirmative. Again, let me express my appreciation uh, to each of you for being with us today. Let me remind you that each, you each have five minutes to deliver your remarks. Of course, the full text of your written statement will be entered in the hearing record. Uh, and we'll start with you, Mr. Kozak. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Weiss and distinguished members of the subcommittee. My name is Jerry Kozak, and I am Vice President of the International Dairy Foods Association. Today I appear before you on behalf of one of our constituent organizations, the Milk Industry Foundation. MIF is the National Trade Association for Processors of Fluid Milk and Milk Products, and we appreciate the opportunity to participate in today's hearing. More than two years ago, this subcommittee conducted a review about allegations of the milk supply that they contained harmful residues of animal drugs. As a result of the February 1990 hearing, there was a great deal of media attention and negative publicity for our dairy industry. However, we stood firm in our conviction that our milk supply continued to be the safest in the entire world. There was a great deal of confusion and media attention, and our industry accepted the challenge of taking the extra steps that this subcommittee recommended to ensure even safer products. Although the conclusion of your first hearing indicated that milk was safe, the industry was challenged to improve the milk monitoring network. Specifically, the subcommittee asked the milk industry to begin utilizing new, more sensitive screening methods for detecting residues, 
and that a national statistically valid reporting system be established to report the results of industry, state, and federal screening efforts. Today it is with great pride and a sense of accomplishment that we appear again before your subcommittee to report our progress. Our monitoring network is far superior than it was two years ago, and we believe milk is safe beyond a doubt. During the February 1990 hearing, it was indicated that the official method was not sensitive enough to detect at the safe or tolerance level many of the drugs used to treat dairy cows. This subcommittee challenged FDA and the milk industry to utilize new, more sensitive screening methods so that we could be assured that no milk with harmful residues would reach the shelf. MIF joined with the National Dairy Board and the National Milk Producers Federation in sponsoring a research project at Virginia Polytechnical Institute and State University to evaluate the efficacy of the screening tests that were currently on the market. Methods such as HPLC were impractical for use in our industry in a national screening program for incoming milk tankers. The research project at VPI had one simple goal, identify those tests that could detect the target levels for seven classes of drugs commonly used to treat dairy cows and to provide our industry with accurate and economical tests which could then be used to improve and increase our milk monitoring efforts. By sponsoring the VPI research, it was our strategic plan to request the National Conference of Interstate Milk Shippers to recognize these new tests for use by industry and to recommend a change in the pasteurized milk ordinance. The disassay method takes approximately two and a half hours to provide tests, making it difficult to test each incoming tanker in a timely manner. Current dairy plant pr receiving practices require fast, reliable screening methods. VPI completed this research by conducting more than 20,870 evaluations on these test kits. Some test kits did not make it, while others were proven effective for detecting at or below the established safe levels. A copy of the VPI results were released simultaneously to the states and FDA prior to the NCIMS conference in May of 91. In May of 91, NCIMS adopted many significant changes to the PMO. These changes were fully endorsed by the milk industry, and in fact, we recommended many of the new requirements. Those specific changes have already been um, outlined in, by previous speakers. Immediately in May of 91, we advised our member companies to implement the testing of every incoming milk tanker using these methods. We encouraged our milk industry to begin using these tests because we believe that the VPI results demonstrated that they were reasonably accurate and efficient. These changes were mandated as of January 1st, 1992, and these requirements present, we believe, a significant milestone in assuring the public that our milk industry is committed to employing the most stringent health and safety requirements of any food product in our country. At the same time, we also recognize that the testing and monitoring is not the sole solution to controlling drug residues. The National Milk Producers Federation, in cooperation with the American Veterinary Medical Association, jointly instituted a 10-point milk and dairy beef quality assurance program designed to properly instruct farmers and veterinarians in the proper use of animal drugs and herd health management. Our industry believes that information education of producers and veterinarians will bring about understanding and acceptance. Milk quality entails much more than screening for drug residues, and we believe prevention on the farm is the long-term solution. Much hard work and effort have gone into implementing this program. It's our strategic plan to one day replace the philosophy of massive screening at the plant level and replace it with the quality assurance program accompanied by the test cow side testing on each dairy farm. However, until we are satisfied with the efficacy of this program, we will continue to erect a steel curtain at testing at our plants. The second part of the plan was to set up a national reporting system to report the results of federal state efforts. It was important for our industry to institute our own reporting system during this interim, and this was accomplished in 1990. I'd like to report on the results of our progress. During each of the two calendar years, 1990 and 91, MIF completed a survey of its member companies who process fluid milk. The responses for, were from 264 grade A plants in 1990 and 283 in 19, in, out of 367 in 1991. The volume of milk represented by our surveys was, was 5.4 billion gallons, or 90% of the total volume in 1990, or as the 1991 survey represented, 5.9 billion gallons, or 92% of the volume. 
The total number of tests conducted for 1990 was approximately 2.1 million and 2.2 million in 1991. This was an increase of over 65,000 tests performed from the previous year. Of these totals, 2,540 tankers were rejected as being positive in 1990, which represents only a 0.12 percent rejection rate and 1,797, or 0.08% were rejected in 1991. This is a, represents a 33% decrease in the rejection rate. The results of the survey also show that 99% of all the respondents were testing each milk tanker for beta-lactam. In addition, and I want to clear this up, our plants have instituted a random screening program for other classes of drugs. In 1991, 45% were had a random screening program for sulfonamides. 42% were screening at some point for sulfamethazine, 36% for tetracycline, and 20% for genomycin. We expect that these numbers will be significantly increased in 1992. And more importantly, these results demonstrate that all of these plants have switched from using the disassay method for screening these drugs to those tests which FD, with VPI demonstrated were capable of detecting these specific classes of drugs at or below the targeted levels. We believe these results demonstrate extensive progress made by our industry, and we are thoroughly committed to improving our safety network. However, we can't do it alone. We need the full cooperation of the states and FDA. In that sense, we, we offer the following recommendations. These recommendations are not criticisms of FDA, but should be reflected to review a constructive outline um, to develop the partnership that Congressman Gunderson talked about this morning. One, we believe FDA should refocus their present efforts solely on developing costly and regulatory methods such as HPLC and utilize their resources to assist the industry and states in evaluating the screening tests that are economical, accurate, and practical for use in a national monitoring program. Two, FDA should refocus their present monitoring and sampling network using HPLC and utilize these effective screening methods. We believe this would facilitate uh, FDA to increase the number of samples taken and would assure the statistical relevance of their sampling program. Three, FDA should institute tighter controls for the use of drugs in food producing animals and provide incentives for the approval of additional drugs for lactating dairy cows. And four, as an overall strategy, FDA should assist the states and the industry in establishing a national quality assurance program on the farm, shifting their focus to, from isolated detection to prevention. In closing, Mr. Chairman, we want to again thank you for allowing us to report our progress. Because of your challenge two years ago, the dairy industry network has been greatly enhanced. We believe we have the safest milk supply in the world, and we believe our information presented today uh, constitutes the, um, the integrity of, of, of those results. We thank you. Senator Maxwell, as always, it's a pleasure to welcome you back here, and uh, we're prepared for your testimony. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And let's see, is this thing on? Yeah, perhaps on close, closer to you, though. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the uh, subcommittee. I appreciate this opportunity to participate in this hearing. I didn't know it was going to be all day long, though. Um, I'm proud to be a part of the hearing and appear as a representative of my profession, my chosen profession, veterinary medicine. I'm also pleased as a, to be here and testifying as a former congressional colleague. Today I'm representing the American Veterinary Medical Association and its more than 52,000 member veterinarians. Accompanying me today is Dr. Christine Kamen to my left here, who is a graduate of the College of Veterinary Medicine at Cornell and who is a food animal veterinarian primarily involved in dairy practice in uh, her state, your state, Mr. Chairman, too, New York State. I, um, I believe that general accounting office reports are sometimes, not always, but sometimes are revealing and helpful for Congress and the entire country. But the jury's still out on this report. I was very surprised, Mr. Chairman, to hear of the subcommittee's practice, and I gather the, all of the subcommittees of this committee, 
of calling a hearing on a GAO report without anyone being able to see the report. Now, I believe that myself and the rest of the people who have testified here today have something to offer that is helpful. But if we're going to address the General Accounting Office and if there's report and if there's some significance to that report, then we certainly ought to be addressing specific parts of that report. Well, that's impossible. Now, I was here in the House uh, from 1969 through 1976, and then in the Senate following that until 1988. And I used the General Accounting Office myself and found their reports sometimes good and sometimes indifferent and misleading. Uh, you, don't, you know, you, sometimes you wonder whether you're flipping a coin on what you're going to get out of it. But I hope this report has some value. But as I sat here today and listened, if the thrust of this report is to be highlighted by some 80 or 64 drugs in that list that I just glanced at, I don't think there's much to that report. If that's a highlight of that report, I just don't think there's much substance to it. The question of drugs appearing in milk or meat or anything we eat is, first of all, is it harmful? Will it, first of all, will it leave a residue? And secondly, is it harmful? And that's what has to be sorted out of that laundry list of drugs. I, I am practiced veterinary medicine now uh, since I first came here. That's 69, what is that, 23 years ago? Some of the drugs that I used to use, I now learn, are completely banned. And if they're completely banned, then the proposition is, who's going to enforce the ban? <coughs> I would agree that FDA has a big role in that. But if somebody is using an illegal drug in the food supply, that's not the only enforcer. There's state law in almost every state. There is also ordinance in many cities and municipalities. And a question of a criminal action is involved. So that's one little category of that 80, and I don't know how big a category it is. I'm led to believe there might be as many as 10 or 15 listed there are already banned. The second point is, Which of them, which of them leave residues that are harmful? Now let's concentrate on those. Let's concentrate on those. I haven't had the chance to go through this to see whether they really dwell on that. But from what I've heard, I hear too much about just glossing over. Oh, there's 60 days. 64, I've heard two figures, 64 and 80. 80 drugs indicating or implying that they all ought to be tested for. Well, those that are harmful certainly should be tested for. Now, oh, I'm, not, I'm not going to gloss over the fact that I think veterinarians have something to add, something to embellish this hearing. I don't, I don't think there's any question in most people's mind the veterinarians are right in the front lines of public health. That's our training. That's part of our calling. <clears throat> That's part of how we serve the public and how we serve more specifically, more specifically, how we serve our communities. So our families and our friends' families and the entire community get some benefit out of what we know about public health. I'm not unaware that the safest milk supply in the world is right here, in the United States. I want to keep it that way. I'm not unaware that, that the, um, the best, the foremost group that regulates, regulates drugs medicines, chemicals that get into the food supply is the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. 
I'm not unaware that they are the model that most other countries strive to, to follow, to copy, to get to be as good as they are. Now, I've done my share as a practicing veterinarian and as a member of Congress. I have done my share of criticizing what the FDA does and what they don't do. But I'm not going to lose track of this, of, the, uh, of that excellence that exists in FDA. And I hope, I hope I can be constructive in what they're going to, what they are doing now or should be doing or what we'd like them to do. Because Senator, we do your a, time we, has expired. If you'd like to sum up and uh, conclude, I'd appreciate it. We can it. do a lot better. This is all summary, Mr. Chairman. We're here as a profession to inform the subcommittee of things that we think can be done better. And first of all, the number one item on that is we want to change the law, the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, to codify the policy of using so-called extra-label drugs by veterinarians. We think codifying and putting it in the statute will start a process of not only making sure the veterinarians are legally using drugs, which is, in my mind is in question right now, but also to start the process of drawing attention to the veterinary profession and to everybody else, to everybody else, that being careful about how you use drugs and being sure that the withdrawal periods and the necessary testing for residues is done and don't exceed harmful limits is followed health institute would go much further they like what we have on our bill but they would go much further and i don't object to where where they want to go to get more drugs approved and the food and drug administration we all know that any administration where they ask whether they like a whether they like a a bill or will support a bill cannot say anything and will not say anything unless it was their own idea or unless the administration whoever whoever's in the white house has approved it as part of the president's policy so their answer has been appropriate so far uh, beyond that we'd like the development of a system of incentives to encourage a greater number of animal drug approvals a broader for a broader range of species and conditions We'd like a validation of residue testing methods. We'd like establishment of tolerance and safe levels for pharmaceutical compounds. We'd like an implementation of a system of monograms of animal drugs through the U.S. Pharmacopeia so that accurate, unbiased scientific information may be more Senator, readily we have, accessible we have you to the practicing statement. veterinarian. That's all part of the record now, and I appreciate that uh, you waited a long time, but I'd like to adjourned this is hearing at a relatively early hour. Uh, I, I, I think I agree. Your time has so you have my around. entire statement. Right. We'll put, put it in the record. Thank you. Um, Mr. Kozak, uh, the subcommittee has learned that during the first three months of 1992, uh, nearly one million pounds of beta-lactam tainted milk was dumped in New York State over 800,000 pounds in Minnesota and over 11 million pounds in Wisconsin. Don't these figures suggest that beta-lactams are being misused by the dairy industry? I think what they suggest, uh, Mr. Weiss, is that our milk monitoring system is working. Um, we want to point out that those rejections mean that that milk never reached the shelf right. and that the whole purpose of the program is to cause that rejection before it enters the milk processing plant. Well, it's obvious that uh, that tainted milk, in fact, is getting through the process. It was caught just to this extent in the first couple of months of, of this year when that new policy went into effect. Um, Mr. Kodak, as you know, FDA permits both food-producing animals and non-food-producing animals to receive drugs on, a, on an extra-label basis. Similarly, the legislation supported by the veterinarians group 
would legalize the practice for food and non-food producing animals. Does the Milk Industry Foundation oppose the use of drugs on an extra label basis for food producing animals? And if so, please explain why. We think that it would be certainly prudent to take a look at uh, the differences between the use of extra label drugs on food producing animals versus uh, extra label drugs on, for instance, pets. And we would encourage FDA um, to examine the criteria between those two categories and to establish tighter controls. Senator Melcher, on May 8, 1992, the Animal Health Institute, which represents the animal drug companies, wrote your organization to say it would not support the extra label drug use legislation that your group was trying to get introduced in the House and the Senate. <clears throat> the Animal Health Institute described the bill as, quote, narrow and counterproductive. Do you know what the basis is for their opposition to your bills, to your bill? Well, I've sat in meetings with the representatives of the Animal Health Institute, and they always say, well, yeah, good idea. Uh, but it doesn't go far enough. So <clears throat> I think what they're interested in is including incentives for more, uh, well, for including incentives, incentives for their members, drug companies, uh, to uh, produce and seek more approvals. Now, um, I don't know if they got a a concrete proposal ready on that, but whenever they do, I'd like to see it. We'd like to see more uh, uh, more uh, drugs produced and approval and incentives that would lead to that. According to a May 26, 1992 FDA memorandum, uh, Center for Veterinary Medicine Director Guest was asked his views on your legislation. The memorandum states, quote, that he does not think that FDA should actively support this bill, that this particular bill falls short of achieving a solution to the problem, that industry has said that it can't support the present bill. Close quote. The subcommittee has found no record of FDA communicating those views directly to your group. Are you aware of FDA's assessment of your legislative effort? Yeah, we work closely uh, with FDA talking about this problem, and, and um, I wouldn't expect them, I wouldn't expect any federal agency to say, yeah, we'll work actively uh, to pass your bill, unless it was part of the president's program. I've never known an administration that uh, gets out of line on that one. The usual question from all the authorizing committees has always been, uh, give us a report, here's a bill, give us a report on it. Well, we haven't had a hearing yet, so that hasn't happened, but when it does happen, when we do have a hearing, I hope we do sometime, we do have a hearing on it. I think the Food and Drug Administration got it right back to us. It is not part of the President's program. And, uh, but I hope they also say that uh, uh, we have no uh, particular opposition to it. That's, a, that's about the most we can expect out of them. Uh, this is a pretty low on, on everybody's priority list. Not that I agree. It ought to be higher. I think public health ought to be about as high as any priority. But it's pretty much low on any administration's uh, priority list, and if we're a Democrat president sitting down there in the White House, I, I don't expect, uh, unless we're lucky and have done a lot of extra work with the White House, we get a pronouncement that says, yes, by all means, we're in favor of the bill. That's, the, as you know, uh, Mr. Chairman, those, uh, those types of endorsements are uh, hard to get. Mr. Payne. Yes, uh, Mr. Kozar, you mentioned uh, several years ago when this a similar hearing to this was held and you indicated there was a lot of negative press uh, generated regarding the uh, quality of, uh, of milk. Uh, what, um, the, what impact did that have on the industry? You found, did you find that there was a, uh, a drop off of, uh, of your of the business overall, did it have a very negative effect? Uh, are less people using, drinking milk now than before because of this negative uh, press you said were generated at the last hearing of this committee? 
We didn't notice any sales drop off, Mr. Payne, but uh, uh, we did uh, we did encounter quite a bit of inquiries. Uh, what we did was turn that type of um, uh, reaction into explaining what our milk monitoring system is. We got the facts out. In addition, we stood firm in our conviction that what we were doing was on the right track. Um, and instead of worrying too much about what the negative publicity was, we. We funded the research to do the kinds of things that this subcommittee asked us to do, and uh, um, our, our, um, I think our track record over the last two years has been an excellent one, and I think that the media has recognized that the dairy industry is striving forward to, uh, to do that. And uh, as a result, there, uh, understand there are some new processes that uh, have been uh, implemented, and, and as you indicated earlier when the chairman mentioned about the amount of of um, tainted milk that had to be uh, destroyed, uh, disposed of. Uh, you indicated that that's right. It shows that you're doing a better job and you've imposed uh, different standards that therefore make things uh, more accurate, correct? Yes. As a matter of fact, one of the things that we want to clear up is that all of the, we have uh, information that we are not just rejecting milk uh, for beta lactams, that our random screening programs indicate that we are rejecting milk tankers for tetracyclines, uh, residues for sulfonamides. And so we're convinced that the safety network that we've established is catching those drugs that are of most importance and it is not reaching the shelf. And therefore, I guess you could conclude then the initial tenor of your of your remarks uh, indicated somewhat of a frustration or a disturbance about the negative press generated, but I guess you could conclude then that evidently the hearing served a very useful purpose. Uh, it had uh, created the, uh, the industry to be uh, a little bit more diligent, and as a result, your product is in your, in your uh, uh, mind is even uh, more closely uh, uh, check then is better quality and and so the the final end is more or less that it was uh, productive to to continue to monitor something as sensitive as the quality of milk well as as, as I think you're aware uh, milk is one of the most emotional products that we produce in our country and the milk industry has to be ever vigilant um, and go beyond any other product because the consumer expects much more out of the safety of our milk. And of course, our industry is committed to ensuring that that happens. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, that, that's just the point I was trying to get out. And uh, you know, we, we're very concerned too because it is, it is a uh, product that uh, the um, that this nation has the pride of having the best, and uh, it's a very important commodity in, in, in areas and a very useful and and necessary item and once the uh, confidence is shattered uh, I, I think then they were doing a disservice not only to the health of the country but to a very important industry and um, uh, so I, I would just like to uh, I guess uh, uh, indicate that I suppose we need to because of the nature of milk and the sensitivity continue to to monitor try to come up with new ideas to try to uh, find out uh, what uh, which of these uh, drugs, as the senator said, uh, they're not all bad, they're not all good, but maybe what we're saying is that the FDA ought to come up with some, with some tests of those that they haven't been dealing with so that we can have a clear, as clear picture of all of them, if possible, as we have of the four or the 12 that they do uh, regularly test. Uh, that's all. I'll yield back the uh, balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Chairman. We haven't called on you because I assume that you were there with Senator Melcher, and uh, that if you had something to say, that uh, you would feel free to do so, or Senator Melcher would ask you to do so. So it's up to you. I came today to the hearings as a representative veterinarian from New York State, and I think I do fairly represent, it, represent the dairy veterinarians in rural practice, the people who treat dairy cows on a daily basis. One common thread that I have heard in listening to all the testimony today, that presented by people representing the legislature, 
the GAO, the FDA, milk industry, and my colleague, Dr. Melcher, is this. We must work on this together. Milk quality is of extreme importance to all of us. It is a high priority, but the key to maintaining it in its utmost purity is a spirit of cooperation amongst all parties. There's no one here who's more concerned about milk quality than I am as a veterinarian or than my clients are as dairy farmers. And we all want to make this a cooperative effort. The AVMA has a couple of suggestions to help improve things a little bit. We're, we're very encouraged by Congressman Stenholm's bill that would legalize extra label drug usage for us because use of those drugs is vital to ensuring the safety of our milk supply. There will never be a drug approved for every possible use, for every possible species. We need to have that bill passed. That's important to the safety of our milk supply. But once again, I must stress that this is going to require cooperation from all quarters. And I think it behooves the legislature to do everything in their power to encourage and foster that sense of cooperation among all parties. Well, I thank, thank you. you very much. And uh, I appreciate uh, your comments. The uh, sad fact is that uh, we've all, or most of us, have been trying to get the FDA to move more quickly and more urgently in this area uh, by any standard. Uh, the pace at which they have moved has been abominably slow. And I just don't think that it, it's really acceptable. I should say, and, and this is not unique to the Trade Association of the American uh, uh, Veterinary Medical Association, uh, most trade associations, uh, while the individual practitioners, I think, have idealism running through their veins, the trade associations, by and large, don't. And uh, their, their aim normally goes beyond idealism. And the unhappy fact is that uh, it seems to me that the AVMA is, seems to be much more concerned with the well-being of uh, the veterinarian rather than the well-being of the consuming public. Our concern is the well-being of the consuming public. And I'm pleased that the industry, the milk industry uh, representatives, have in fact accepted a challenge and have been moving forward and doing work on their own in addition to demanding that uh, the FDA move more quickly. I think that the effort that the uh, Veterinary Medicine Trade Association people are undertaking uh, is, is counterproductive and uh, I think that it, it's, it's mischievous. I think ultimately it would, uh, it would end up making it almost impossible to have any control over the field at all. And uh, so I would hope that uh, there'll be some sober rethinking, reevaluation of, uh, of, of uh, codifying extra label use. I mean, that, that, that it seems to me is, 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 is the path of... Uh, no constructive gain for hardly any, anyone. Uh, but in any event, we've taken a long time on these hearings today. Uh, there is a vote on the floor, and I think that we've probably, at this point, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, the first of all, of most first, everybody. First of all, we're not a trade association. We're a professional association. Right, we have okay. A, and we take... Uh, That's what the plastic uh, surgeons say, too. We take an oath of, of, of trying to help animals. We don't hold it, uh, uh, we don't want to shove it aside lightly by you or anybody else uh, that uh, somehow we're acting on, on, uh, with a mischievous 
notion. We know what the law, current law is, and we know it should be improved, and we know how to do that. Okay. Uh, the second bells have sounded. The subcommittee now stands adjourned, subject to the call of the chair. Thank you all very much. Send your questions or comments about this hearing to the House Government Operations Subcommittee at B372 Rayburn House Office Building, Washington, D.C., 20515. Washington, D.C., this is C-SPAN 2, a cable satellite public affairs network. Now here is our latest schedule update. Next, a discussion on recent events in the news, Washington Post.